Kicking off the list at number 10, accidental science, AKA the discovery of penicillin. Sometimes miracles happen when nobody's looking. Alexander Fleming first discovered penicillin back in 1928. At the time, he was actually studying Staphylococcus, which is a bacteria that causes infections and boils, all that nasty stuff. But right before Alexander left for a two week vacation, he left a Petri dish with some of that Staphylococcus on the lab table rather than storing it away in an incubator. During this well needed time off, a penicillium mold spore just drifted in there, either through a window or the lab door, some Horton Here's a Who adventure. This tiny speck was well on its way it was the perfect conditions for a spore flight. The temperature of the room wasn't too breezy and the lack of one Alexander Fleming allowed time for the mold to fight back and prevent that bacteria from growing any further. He discovered this antibacterial substance was only produced by strains of penicillium. Yeah, the guy accidentally creates penicillin on his time off. What a great time. The 20s were an odd but brilliant time. Number nine, prohibition. It's a law that puts fear into wine drinking moms and beer drinking dads across the nation. For there was a time when the sale and consumption of alcohol was banned. That means it was a dry country, not one drop to be had. Except for those uh, found in loopholes and all the other crazy loopholes in the system. And by that, I actually mean organized crime filling the shoes of breweries and other openings like uh, literal underground bars called speakeasies to keep the sauce flowing. You know what I mean. Now, to be fair, there was an issue with drinking back in the day, but there's a few issues with banning it as well. The first being that it was in high demand, like stupid high even before it was banned. So banning it basically gave a green light to bootleggers and criminals to make millions, and they did. And second, it was America's fifth largest industry, putting many out of work and dissolving a very large portion of tax revenue. No surprise it didn't work out. Number eight, the work week. Okay, seriously, who do we have to talk to? Who do we have to blame for having to work nine to five Monday to Friday? Dolly Parton has a groovy tune about it, but when did the 40 hour work week start? Uh, 1926 is your answer. The Ford Motor Company of all companies. Yeah, who do you think? They were the first to have factory workers clock in and out 40 hours a week with a weekend. Nice. Whereas before, you maybe had one day off, maybe, depending on what you were doing. Obviously more time to rest, eat, and clear your mind, maybe work out. This increased productivity, so it spread like wildfire. Cut to today, we're now advocating for a four day work week. We're getting greedy, I know. Shorter hours, same workload, apparently this is going well. Productivity is soaring. In Iceland, for example, 2,500 workers tested this four day work week. That's literally 1% of Iceland's population, so it worked. Pretty big test run. But now 86% of Iceland's workforce have shorter hours. It's great, seems like we're well on our way. So sorry, Mr. Ford, we're taking back our Fridays. Number five, the smooth hand fish. Not to be confused with cool hand Luke. The smooth hand fish was the first time in modern history where a marine type fish has gone extinct. This fish was a shallow water bottom dweller and I personally love him because he looks like one of the Bowser's minions. He looks moody. He has a fin that protrudes out of his face out of his face. Just 200 years ago, you would have seen these smooth dudes in the land down under. It lived in Australia, in Tasmania's warm waters, and what made this fish so unique, as its name hints towards, is its hands. The smooth hand fish would seemingly walk along the ocean floor using its fins <laughs> as hands. The smooth hand fish would seemingly walk along the ocean floor using its fins as hands. So an angry looking fish with hands and a horn would walk towards you? Hard pass. Graham Edgar, marine ecologist at the University of Tasmania, shed some light on its habits, explaining that these fish were homebodies. They didn't have a large habitat. Ooh, they just had like all the hands for the house. They spent most of their time sitting in the seabed with an occasional flap for a few meters if they're disturbed. At that point, they would just walk with their hands away from the drama. That's how I want to walk away from drama from now on. Like somebody brings it up to me and I'm just like, <laughs> Number four, Permian Triassic, AKA the Great Dying. Okay, what a nickname, love it. And one of the most mysterious extinction events on this list, let's talk about it. The Permian Triassic extinction event destroyed the vast majority of life on Earth over 250 million years ago. Life was booming and then silence. Scientists have been boggled and bamboozled for years, but these pieces may finally be coming together. This event is not to be confused with the death of the dinosaurs, that's a different thing, which is still not as sad as the film The Land Before Time. No, this was an event so great that trees, plants, lizards, proto-mammals, insects, fish, mollusks, again, always mollusks, and then microbes didn't see coming. No one saw this coming at all. 
nine out of 10 marine species, seven out of 10 land species just entirely vanished. Scientists discovered this event by evaluating fossils and sedimentary rock. While all the previous layers were teeming with life, there was a brief period where it all vanished, like a hamburger without toppings or tartar sauce. Gone in 60 seconds. Just a smooth burger, nothing's getting in the way of that. No tartar sauce dripping down your shirt. Absolutely, that's how fast it went. There are two explanations in the running. One was that it was due to a massive volcanic event, and two, of course, an asteroid. But so far, there have been no traces of either. One hint is the massive anomaly in Wilkes Land, Antarctica. NASA spotted gravitational changes, which indicate an object of immense size sitting in a 300 mile wide crater. A massive object over 151 miles across and dives about 2,700 feet deep beneath the ice could be the massive rock that reset the world 250 million years ago. Or, I know what you're thinking, could also be aliens. We're 50-50 here, we're trying to figure it out. Number three, passenger pigeons. Commonly confused with the morning dove, the passenger pigeon once ruled the skies over Canada as recently as the 19th century. They're quite similar to the pigeons we see today, only instead of being aggressive and covered in mustard, they were quite graceful. Billions of these orange, orange, orange beauties painted the skies and rumor has it they would fly in flocks so large it would block the sun out for a couple hours. Flocks that block. But only a few decades passed and the passenger pigeons are no more. What happened? The very last passenger pigeon was Martha. Oh, Martha. She passed away in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1914, so we took a look at her DNA to see if Martha held any secrets to their extinction. They discovered Martha had a low genetic diversity for such a growing population. Natural selection and hunting eliminated arguably the coolest looking bird out there. Number two, the sixth extinction. Remember the book Rachel told me to mention? Well, here it is again, it's that good. Here's a big question no one is ready for. Are we part of the sixth extinction? Is it happening right now? In the past, asteroids and ice ages have all caused massive extinction events, but after human beings invented the wheel and discovered fire, things started to change. In the 1800s, industrialization drove up extinction rates and continues to do so. Based on this list alone, we know how much human beings have played a role in extinction events of the past. Have we created one that we can't stop? According to Elizabeth Kohlberg, across the world, scientists are monitoring what could be the largest extinction event since the dinosaurs. That's right, the way human beings interact with the environment and affect biodiversity could be more deadly than an asteroid hitting the Earth. Come on, we gotta wake up. With an ever-climbing list of endangered species, Kohlberg and the world asks this question. Could this be mankind's lasting legacy, and is it too late to change it? And next up we have the dunkleosis. Now it may sound silly because it has the word dunk in it, <laughs> but this ancient fish did not shoot threes. It actually shot its head at you into self-defense at 50 milliseconds a jab. The dunkleosis was a 34 foot long armored fish that came from the Devonian era. Its fossil was first discovered in 1867 by Dr. David Dunkel. He of course named it after himself in Dunkel fashion. It swam confidently in subtropical waters and weighing around one ton, which is 2,000 pounds, the dunk was kind of a bully, but it's not his fault. He was born this way. Its massive skull was well equipped with two fangs and these razor sharp teeth would rub against each other as they grew. So if the dunk's big rock head wasn't intimidating enough, he's also sharpening his mouth 24 seven. As for diet, the dunk would use those fangs on anything that crossed its path during their coral commute. They would eat fish, sharks, and dare I say, other dunk leo style. Cannibal fang fish for the win. Luckily these guys aren't around anymore. They all went extinct around 360 million years ago during the Devonian extinction. For a scary look fish, it has a rather sweet name. Shout out to David Dunkel. Thanks for all your hard work. Kicking off the list at number 10, the Battle of Hastings. Okay, we look back at jesters and jugglers of the Dark Ages, and we laugh. We chuckle a little bit, rightfully so. The earliest accounts of the fool go back to the 11th century. It was one of the best jobs to have, despite how, you know, Game of Thrones made jesters look. It was an honorable job. The fool's payment also was no joke, my friend. Roland Le Petour was rewarded with 30 acres of land from King Henry II, so long as he kept farting and juggling. Not, not a bad gig. Don't let looks deceive you, however. During the Battle of Hastings in October 1066, it had one of the most badass minstrels I have ever heard of. No jokes with this guy, that's for sure. Now for starters, this was the same battle where William the Conqueror defeated King Harold. Historic, of course. One of the bloodiest battles in history. 
How it all began though. William's minstrel, his fool, sang at English troops while he was juggling his sword around. He was singing, he was doing a little show. He's juggling and saying some probably nasty things. That's when an English soldier came forward to challenge Taylor Fair, and then he was promptly killed. And so began one of the bloodiest battles in history. Yeah, he taunted them until they made the first move. Is that allowed? I'd be so upset. I'd be upset. Number nine, Malin, Matt's daughter. On part one, we had a few cases where women were found guilty of practicing witchcraft. Of course. Now, this was a common theme for the Dark Ages, sadly, but it's one thing for a town to randomly turn against you out of the blue because they're spooked, whatever the case, but imagine your family, someone who actually knows you. That's exactly what happened to Malin Matt's daughter. She was a Swedish widow, and her own daughter told everybody in town that she was a witch. Yeah, she was the last victim of the Great Swedish Witch Hunt in 1676, also known as the Great Noise. Malin goes down in history because one, it was thankfully one of the last, but two, she never admitted. Mm, no way, she's like, nope, I'm not a witch. That's it. She didn't cry out in pain, she didn't beg for forgiveness, anything like that. She said it was all hogwash and she stood by it quietly. Her daughter was actually later found guilty of perjury, so she too met a similar fate. Don't talk smack about your mothers. Number eight, toilet trouble. What a transition. Here on Bumblebee, we've talked a lot of smack about ancient toilets. God, they were so bad, I can't. I, I would never, I would hold it for 36 years. Apparently these things could also take lives, yeah. In the middle of the summer, nobody around you, you could have been a victim to a medieval toilet. Yeah, how does that happen? Let's talk about it. In 1523, a Cambridge baker named George Duncan, he went out to the cesspit and the guy sadly fell in. Now normally you could just crawl back out, sure, but this fateful day, Duncan was quite intoxicated. Poor Poor guy suffocated in his own, what a horrible way to go out, one of the worst ways to go out. Number seven, pole vaulting. This is one of the most impressive sports to exist. We do not talk about pole vaulting enough. Pole vaulting is insane. Just guy with a stick over a building, are you kidding? That's, that's Mario physics. Today we admire athletes like Sweden's Armand Mondo Duplantis. This guy broke the world record at the 2020 Olympics. He leaped over six meters with a stick. Back in the dark ages, however, this was not a sport. No, this was your commute. The day pole vaulting was born was supposedly Christmas Day, December 25th, 1521. A Christmas miracle. Now we have pole vaulting. A laborer named Robert Baker was heading home from the church. It was Christmas, he was tired. He decided to take a shortcut over a pond, so he grabbed a long pole and Voila, he just made it. Now, don't try this. We don't recommend this as a travel option, obviously, because later on, Baker's pole ended up snapping mid-leap and then he ended up drowning, sadly. Yeah, the poor guy bridged to Terabithia himself. So, I wouldn't recommend pole vaulting. Number six, the iron chair. Not to be confused with the iron throne, although I'm sure that seat isn't quite comfortable either. I have a funny back, you know, I have to, I gotta sit, ooh. That's where we go. Who to crack in the mic? The iron chair was a device used in medieval punishments. Yeah, it sounds crazy to say, but this one seems more tame compared to some of the other devices used, you know? Like I mentioned the ducking stool in part one. That was, that was bad. This one's more Viking. This one's actually pretty brutal. These spikes don't look like much upon first glance, but they easily can poke through your skin. The chair is actually designed to pierce through the skin without hitting any vital organs. So you had to sit still. Definitely had to sit still. You know, I actually lied to you guys. The more I explain this one, the more I think it's the worst of the worst. I guess this is why they call it the Dark Ages. Oh my gosh. Okay, number seven, Valentine's Day. Not the most romantic Valentine's Day ever, but maybe one of the most infamous. Back in 1929, organized crime was no joke. It was everywhere. Thanks to prohibition and a lot of corruption, it was the age of gangsters. However, one incident in 1929 changed things. On February 14th, 1929, seven gang members were deleted. This proved to be too much for the public at the time, and the final straw in a large string of violent crimes was up. Until this point, a lot of crooks and gangsters like Al Capone were idolized for the lavish lifestyles and ritzy and swanky nights in the town. This, however, was one step too far and helped to further reform and crime, giving a certain FBI predecessor to rise up and eventually found the FBI. The lesson here? Sure, being a gangster is great. Sign your autographs, live like a fat cat in your penthouse. But there's only so much you can get away with. After it was all said and done, Capone got put away too. And if they can get Capone, they can get you. Number six, the birth of brands. 
When it comes to advertisements, you can't even take the bus down the street without seeing hundreds of ads. I'll catch myself staring at a Sunwing ad for 43 minutes just so I can avoid eye contact with Johnny Jingle Keys in front of me. Even growing up, the amount of pop-ups I had to close really fast, my reflexes are so sharp now, all thanks to those gross pop-ups. And it all started 100 years ago. Huge brands began popping up in the 1920s with these fun slogans, big colorful ads. The 20s witnessed the birth of advertisements from Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, Hostess Cakes, Welch's, and of course, one of the most unforgettable, Kool-Aid. Yeah, the Kool-Aid man is 95 years old. Yeah, I bet his knees are starting to feel like glass, that's for sure. Other companies that popped at this time was CVS, the automobile industry, obviously, and two brothers in California named Walt and Roy Disney. Yeah, they had some startup cartoon studio. Not sure what happened there. Best of luck, guys, keep going. Hopefully they have a GoFundMe, maybe. Number five, the League of Nations. World War I, she was a little bit of a doozy. Unlike some wars, World War I actually changed a lot after it was said and done. Borders changed, lines on maps, empires fell, some rose. Political ideas changed and the history of Europe's future was sealed the second the ink dried on the Treaty of Versailles. After the nations who were involved with the war took stock of what happened and it was clear we could never let this happen again. So the League of Nations was created. Beta UN, if you will. The idea was simple, peace, disarmament, and to step in when such horrific things were to ever happen again. I'm sure they won't. Well, the planning didn't go very well, and when it was finished, the US ultimately didn't decide to join when they were one of the founding members. Ooh. Mind you, the US had a different mindset on foreign wars back then, but they were still involved. The League dissolved shortly after the Second World War ended. Number four, flappers. What a fun word they've been. In August 1920, history was forever changed when the 19th Amendment was passed, finally giving women the right to vote. Now look, in a list of ridiculous events, I'm adding this because it took a ridiculously long time to happen. Yeah, a little twist there for you. At first you're like, what? Relax, we're working. This was post-World War I, when women were still working all these jobs, high paying jobs, might I add. So now there's no way they're gonna let those go. There's momentum in the workforce. So come August 1920, American women got the right to vote officially. Then Margaret Sanger came along the same year, which led us to women's right to birth control. A lot of momentum. Like Big Ched mentioned earlier, prohibition ended legal alcohol sales, but with jazz and women's independence post-war on the rise, you couldn't stop all this momentum. Thus, the flapper girl was introduced to American slang. Yeah, smoking in public, drinking and dancing at jazz clubs, all things that were upsetting their Victorian lineage before them. Oh, you wanna dance to jazz and have fun post-war? How dare thou? You wanna show your calf after working doubles during a war? How dare you? Put those caps away, put that out. Number three, the Russian Revolution. Revolution, comrades. The 1920s were a crazy time, man. And if you look at the history between the US and Russia, it's almost like a hero and a villain origin story. Okay, hear me out. World War I was a bad time for Russia. They dropped out in early 1918, shortly before the whole thing ended. Why? Because the communists were there to take over. That's just how it went. Russia went from a 300 year Romanov rule to communism within a few short years. Safe to say this was having a great effect on the already struggling nation. It seemed that the harder things got, the more communist Russia got. When looking at the states after World War I, for the most part, it was a huge financial gain. And besides being the decade of gangsters and bootleggers, this was the start of many corporations and brands, like Taylor mentioned. It seemed as things got better and became more capitalist. Interesting indeed, duality. Hmm. Number two, the Ponzi scheme. We've all heard the term Ponzi scheme at one point or another, but what does that even mean? Who is this man? Where can I find him? Ah, why are we so mad at him? Why is he scheming so often? Why, who does that? A Ponzi scheme is of course a sham of an operation. It all kicks off back in the 1920s when one Italian immigrant named Charles Ponzi moved to the United States. He arrived to the States with the same goal as anyone, to work. That's it, just to work and you know, be successful. At first, he didn't have much luck, but eventually Charles was hired at Bank Zerosi. And when the bank sadly went bankrupt, Ponzi was SOL. He needed to do something and he needed to do something fast. So he dabbled into smuggling, but he got caught. After he was released, he went into the postal system, started to buy large quantities of postal coupons from countries with, you know, a weak economy, and then he hired a bunch of agents, trained them up good, you know, Wolf of Wall Street style, and the whole idea was that you would promise investors that they would receive double their investment back in return within 45 days. How lovely is that? Thus, the Ponzi scheme is born. Yeah, these agents got 10% commission too, which as far as scams go, 
it's not too shabby. Not bad at all. Number one, Black Tuesday. Uh-oh, stinky. The market crashed and now everyone's going broke. Big oof, right? Adam told me to say that. Anyway, yes, the great market crash of 29. It wasn't good. A mixture of outstanding loans and already declining unemployment percentage, a struggling agriculture sector mixed in with a speck of low wages and stocks just not being worth what they were is the cause of the crash. By 1932, a lot of stocks were only worth 20% of what they originally were before. The stock market crash was not the main cause of the Great Depression, however, it was a symptom of it. The market wouldn't fully be back to normal until after FDR's New Deal, or realistically, when World War II had started and kicked America's, and really, the world's economy back into turbo mode. Number 10, stone toilet paper. It's been said that only two things in life are certain, not living and taxes. However, I think a third point needs to be added, and that's everybody goes number two. It's a part of life. You eat, your body takes in its nutrients, and then it gets rid of the waste. That's the cycle of life. It's kind of beautiful, actually. Then we all have to use an invention that I know we're all thankful for, toilet paper. But have you ever wondered what people of ancient times did? I know I do. After all, there was no Walmartius to purchase Greco Papyrus Rolius or the Greek staple that is olive oil. Trust me, that'll come into play later. Well, the answer, my friend, is very simple. Even simpler than the three seashells, and everybody knows how to use them. Cleansing stones. Yes, that's right. Smooth, rounded stones just for the occasion. My mom always joked around about using newspapers like some folks did in the old days, but stones, they actually use stones to do that part. A little too rough for my uh, my Gerber baby bottom, if you will. No thank you, no. M mom, I was a Gerber baby. Number nine, painted statues. When you close your eyes and think of ancient Greece, what do you imagine? Oh yes, I'm just imagining it right now. Beautiful coastline cities with harbors bustling full of ships carrying fresh fish and cargo. Men and women flocking the brick streets and markets. White marble monuments surround the city like clouds of opulence. And the statues of pure white marble depicting Greek gods and myths of yonder. Sounds great, right? Well, what if I told you that not all these beautiful white statues that you could see in museums were pure white marble as we know them today? Yes, that's right. Greek marble statues had color. They were painted with the best and brightest colors they had at the time. It's only with time that the color has faded. Some people want to repaint only after a few short years. Try a couple thousand. Number eight, beef up. Gotta get the gains, gotta get swole so your Discord crush will send you the heart emojis and oo-oos that you so desire. I'm sorry, that's so cringe, I'm so sorry. At least that's how I'm told romance works these days. Romance might have changed, but working out has not. The ancient Greeks worked out to maintain a peak athletic performance. That's right, brother. However, it wasn't exactly treadmills and pumping iron. One Greek athlete's training involved carrying a cow calf around all day until the calf reached adulthood. Pretty cool. This is all done naked, by the way, though, and slathered in olive oil. Not so cool. Athletes also ate their fair share to keep up with all the working out they did. Some cases up to 10 pounds of meat and bread a day. Talk about beefy boys. That's right, brother. Number seven, one night sneeze. We've all been there. It was a hot summer night. You went out with a couple of friends for girls night. Tonight is all about the ladies. No guys, you say to each other. And now you're in the club and drinks are flowing. And that's when you see him. He's tall, handsome, and blue eyes. You're submitting. Hours later, you find yourself under the sheets up to the neck like it's a primetime sitcom. The sun peers its way through curtains that haven't been cleaned since he bought them. And yes, yes, that's right. That's a one night stand. They happen, and sometimes people just want to have a little fun. Can you blame them? I can't. What I'm getting at is sometimes nights like those can have an 18 year investment after a nine month down payment if you catch my drift. The ancient Greeks had a simple solution for ladies who weren't interested in that kind of bargain. Sneeze. Yes, sneeze. Hit you. Sneeze. Sneeze away the night of Cinco de Mayo tequila shots at a bar called O'Grady's. The Greeks believed if you sneezed a whole bunch, you couldn't get preggers. Simple. Just simple. I can do a sneeze, dude. Simple. Number six, tasteful doctor. As humans today, we have a lot of knowledge in the medical field and we're only getting smarter. Who knows what we'll be capable of in a hundred years? It's kind of amazing to think about. Well, despite the technology that the Greeks did not possess, any college professor today will tell you that they were not stupid. They weren't. We owe a lot to them. 
part of that is in the medical field. For example, urine tests. A lot can be told about a person from their urine. The Greeks knew this, but they didn't have all that fancy schmancy machines to tell them what was in their urine. Instead, they did the next best thing and tasted the forbidden lemonade in order to determine what was wrong with the patient. Sure, you can tell a lot by that way too, but if the person was sick, well, well, you know how that goes. Let's keep the lemonade in the cups, please. Mm, yes, I believe. Yes, you have something wrong with your liver. Number five, Bridget Bishop. In 1692, 500 people lost their lives due to smallpox. This happened after Europeans brought the disease to North America, and then in result, you would get covered in these sores, like pimple like bubbles. It was horrible, it was really painful. So rather than recognize the situation as symptoms from a disease, the fine people of Salem thought, no, they're probably witches. I think they're, I think they're witches who can float and do magic, for sure. That seems more realistic, right? Yeah, for sure. The small Massachusetts village began this wave of hysteria with two young women, Betty Paris and Abigail Williams. They started to show signs of this disease. They were convulsing, acting strange, obviously being, you know, extremely ill. The village doctor, William Greggs, just said at this point that they were bewitched. He's like, uh, here's a word. And they're like, great, that did nothing. He's like, okay. And then other villagers slowly started to show similar symptoms because, well, that's how science works. But at the time, they believed Bridget was the first ever witch. The reason they kicked off this entire Salem witch hunt was Bridget Bishop and her sickness. So over the next few months, around 150 more were convicted, all meeting their similar horrible fate on Gallows Hill. Maybe it was Bridget Bishop, or maybe it was just rye disease. Yeah, who would have thunk? Now it's referred to as St. Anthony's fire. You convulse, you experience delusions, everything's similar. It feels like there's bugs under your skin, which is the worst thing I've ever read in my entire life. But these doctors didn't know that at the time. Everyone thought they were all just cursed, witches. They were not cursed, they just needed help. It's really just that. Oddly enough, in May 1693, just one year later, the Salem witch trials abruptly ended. Huh, weird. Did the town of Salem run out of witches or did they just run out of contaminated rye bread? I vote the latter. It's probably the latter. Number four, steal. Don't steal, please. While it's next to impossible to prove your marriage to somebody back in the medieval days, imagine proving that you're innocent, that you didn't just steal an apple and run it through a village, right? It's also really tough to catch a thief. No alarms, no cameras. It was literally like Assassin's Creed. Just throw your hood up, grab an apple, and then sprint into the woods for 30 minutes and hope for the best. Hope an arrow doesn't go on the way out. That's really it. The markup for stealing was also pretty wild for the time. It kind of had to be. If you stole something worth half a mark in Danish controlled parts of England, you would be fined 80 times that whatever you stole. So you better be a track star. You better have one of those pool vaults handy, my friend. Each ruler had a different way of dealing with theft. It wasn't all the same. So you may have gotten off lucky sometimes. Sometimes, maybe, depends. Again, I'm talking about a time where people believed in witches, people who made ducking stools. They made fun new methods for punishing one another. So, you know, who's to really say? But depending on where you got caught, you might lose a body part or you might just get a slap on the wrist. The reality is, more often than not, anything over half a mark often resulted in death as a punishment. Number three, coffins. Now when you hear the word coffin, odds are you're thinking of vampires or you know, some dude like this in a wooden box, uncomfortable. Coffins in the medieval times are a little bit different. They're outside the front of the castles, these cages, they're usually, you know, hanging off of some dainty like street light looking thing. Usually a crow is pecking away at a skeleton. It's haunting. Those cages are coffins. The victim was placed inside said cage and the period of time they're kept there depends on your crime. Now of course people were left there to die a lot but instead of sharp metal or a rusty chair, people would burn in the sun and then starve to death until animals or birds finished them off. But here's the kicker. Yeah, it gets worse, believe it or not. While these coffins would be placed in open, hot areas, a lot of the time, more often than not, they would be placed in public areas. So crowds would gather, they would talk and then throw stuff at the victim while they were serving their time day after day. Even though you weren't sentenced to death, the town may just vote otherwise. Number two, animal witches. Okay, if you have any pets watching this video, get them out of the room. Cover their little fluffy ears for this. I don't want them getting any ideas. One of the craziest things about looking back to the Salem witch trials has to be that animals were also found guilty of witchcraft. Yeah, like a pig went to trial. Actual court. Grown adults would show up for animals. I'm dead serious. They would accuse animals of witchcraft and wizardry. Yep, 
I wonder what house this pig would belong into. I vote Slytherin. No better sous chef than a golden retriever, in my humble opinion. But to be fair, Airbud played like nine different sports, so you know, it could have happened. On the official list of victims from the Salem witch trials, two cats were accused, as well as two dogs. That's unbelievable. These villagers, their mindset was, if their pet was behaving strangely, it must mean that they're working with witches in the middle of the night. Why of course, why else? What are they, hungry or thirsty? Pfft, no, they're for sure witches. Villagers believed witches traveled at night, not by broom per se, but by riding on the back of their pets. Yeah, it wasn't just dogs either. They thought that witches rode cows, pigs, wolves, dogs, even turtles. Imagine a witch riding a turtle. She would be so late to that cauldron cook off. And finally, number one, Giles Corey. So after part one and now part two, we can safely conclude that the Salem witch trials were a bunch of bull yeah, a bit of a, a bit of bogus, I'd say. Out of the 27 people who had their lives taken away from them during the 1692 trials, 19 were hanged, 17 passed away in prison while serving their sentence, you know, being a witch and all. But the very last victim, Giles Corey, he refused to plead either innocence or guilty, and the law at the time states that you can't be tried otherwise. So they had to try and punish it out of Giles. They had to try and get him to confess so that they can take his land. Yeah, they used brutal measures as well. They laid a heavy board on top of the 81-year-old Giles Corey, and then over the course of two days, boulders were slowly added, making the weight more and more unbearable. They were hoping at this point that Giles would admit something, but every time they asked him anything about being a witch, Giles responded with the same sentence. He just responded with, more weight. Yeah, keep him coming, he says. What a champ. After two days of this punishment, this excruciating pain, Corey did in fact pass away, still in full possession of his estate, which then went to his son-in-law. Now, if he had been found guilty, the government would have taken that from him. So he sadly did the best thing he could have long-term for his family at this point by not admitting. I mean, he had to deal with some of the dumbest and most cruel people that ever walked Salem. It's, it's pretty much just that, nothing to do with Giles or his choices. It's just, hey, check out how insane this town was. Number 10, we will get out of lockdown. I don't know, maybe? We'll see. I think so. I'm starting this one as number 10 because I literally cannot believe we are here. I just got my second dose and it was officially two weeks last Friday, so. Hugs are a coming, and I remember feeling even a few months ago that this would never happen. Researchers estimate that over 9.5 billion doses of the vaccine will be administered by the end of 2022. That means that for weddings, school, restaurants, libraries, work without masks is going to be in our future. With the Delta variant still at play, there is the possibility of other precautions being put in place, but still, if not by 2022, then eventually. <laughs> the vaccines can protect against it, so as long as we keep doing our part to keep each other safe. We are on the way, babies. I'm going to hug so many people. Maybe even you. Or you. Or you, Chris. Number nine, the Sagrada Familia. One of the largest and longest construction projects will finally come to an end. Antonio Gaudi's masterpiece began construction in 1882 and has had nine, nine architects take over since. It is called the Sagrada Familia Church and is located in Barcelona, Spain, or Barcelona, as they say in Vicky Christine Barcelona. I love that. Barcelona? Jordi Folly and his team will be the last people to ever work on it. The pure extravagance and luxury of this building is overwhelmingly breathtaking, but why on earth has it taken so long? Well, the original architect died in 1926, there was the Spanish Civil War, the original project was destroyed and lack of funding. The majority of the project was privately funded and subsidized. The designs that Gaudi laid down are also incredibly complex with each layer and brick containing intricate details. He wanted to build the highest church in the world and that it will be with the central Jesus Tower reaching 172.5 meters. But finally after 150 years of construction the church will finally be complete in 2026. If everything goes well. You never know. As we found out in the last two years. You just never know. Number eight, the triple Jovian eclipse. Some really cool things have already happened these past few months and there's plenty more to come so don't you worry. The next Jovian eclipse is set to happen in 2032. What is that you ask? Well, three of Jupiter's largest moons, Io, Ganymede, and Callisto will align across the planet's surface like a couple of cool space polka dots. Yeah, we'll call them that. Jupiter has 16 moons in total, and the three mentioned are among the biggest in its orbit. The last time this happened was in 2004 and was caught on the Hubble Space Telescope by some miracle. The event happens so quickly, and this time scientists are hoping to capture the event in sharp detail. So stay tuned. Watch your Google. Number seven. We might 
We might live forever? I don't know. Put down the Botox and hold the collagen injections. There might be another way. Thanks to the SENS Research Foundation, we may find a way to turn back the clock when it comes to aging. Dr. Aubrey de Grey is an English author, biomedical gerontologist, and mathematician who believes that one day, one day, aging might be stopped by medical intervention. His research involves attempting to find a way to treat the disease of aging by repairing damage on a molecular level. One of the main causes of aging are dead cells or senescent cells. Once the cell stops multiplying, they release a whole stew of chemicals that cause inflammation and the breakdown of surrounding tissue. Now, Usually our body fights these off because they are recognized as imposters and they are forced to self-destruct, but they accumulate with age. If they are successful at finding a way to diminish these cells, it could mean that they could make a 60 year old feel and look 30 again. Pretty exciting stuff. Not without controversy though. MIT Tech Review challenged molecular biologists to disprove Gray's claims for a chance to win 20 grand, but nobody has yet. So. Number six, NASA's New Horizons spacecraft. Humanity is pretty freaking astounding, and our reach is stretching further and further out into the universe every day. Right now, the Voyager 1 and 2 are currently exploring interstellar space, but NASA just launched yet another incredibly exciting space adventure. NASA's New Horizons spacecraft is currently out in space at a distance of 50 times the distance between Earth and the Sun. Scientists estimate that by the 2040s, it will finally surpass Voyager 1 and 2 in interstellar space and who knows what it will find. New Horizon gets its power source from a single radioisotope thermoelectric generator, which is super cool how it works. Essentially a kind of nuclear battery that sources its power through the natural radioactive decay of plutonium dioxide fuel. What? I'm not a scientist, so that blew my mind. I'm not quite sure if I understand it. Do we understand it? Let us know in the comments. The decay rate is high enough to create a reliable amount of heat so the engine can just keep going and going and going. So it just opens up a future of discoveries, and I'm excited. I'm excited. Number five, athlete juice. Speaking of gross, this one is straight out of Johnny Knoxville's playbook. Shout out to those guys. I hope one day I'm cool enough and famous enough to meet them. Maybe do a bit. Chetty's not and fuss, so I'm down. Anyway, back to the Greeks. Remember when I said the Greek bodybuilders like to oil up? Well, so did the athletes. Here's where it gets gross. After days of events and running around in the dirt, naked with olive oil, these athletes wouldn't always bathe. But why? Well, the answer is marketing. Just like Gatorade commercials of the early 2000s, these athletes were covered in juice. This sludge was scraped off in what I'm sure was a very humanizing experience and jarred up to be sold like a superhero serum for the average Joe Schmo to drink or rub on themselves. This mixture was called Gloyos. No thank you. I will pass. Number 4, Nocturne and Toten. It was 2008. I was alone in the dark one summer night. There illuminating my poor innocent face was Call of Duty World at War, the latest action packed Hollywood blockbuster FPS from Activision. Now I always finish campaigns first before moving on to multiplayer. Just when I thought it was over, a new cutscene started playing, except this one was different. It was dark and the camera was shaky. And that's when I saw them, twisted and screeching, undead, sprinting at me. I have never turned off a console so fast in all my life. Well, it seems the ancient Greeks shared this fear as well. To prevent zombies eating their very smart brains, the Greeks oftentimes buried folks with heavy stuff on top of them, just to prevent them from climbing out of their graves. That's uh, the smartest people on earth, and I think the zombies are going to come get them. That's crazy. That's uh, Guys, come on. Number three, diluted wine. The Greeks were well known for their artisan goods and foods. Their wine is no different. Some good stuff out there. However, did you know that Greeks would dilute their wine with a little H2O? Drinking wine pure was sometimes considered to be an unholy act, as it was said it could make a man unruly. Well, they're not too far off from the truth on that one, actually. Drinking too much wine can make you go a little silly. So yeah, diluting it kind of makes sense. Sometimes during hot weather, if it was available, snow was added for a cool and refreshing drink on the hot Greek island days. That sounds real kind of nice, that kind of like a, an ice spritzer, an I, a Greek ice wine spritzer. How nice! Wow. Number two, the finger. 
The ultimate hand gesture. I know you're gonna have to blur it out or not even put it in, but here we go. That's that's what I'm talking about. The ultimate hand gesture. It starts with a hey, I'm walking here, and ends with a simple finger in the air. It's been used for centuries and will probably be used for many more. Ever wondered where the origins of the most powerful hand gesture besides Darth Vader's force choke come from? Well, the almighty gesture has its origins in ancient Greece. Who would have thought? While no one is 100% sure the exact origins of it, we know it was used back then and it was around. The very interesting Diogenes was known to use it against those passing by he was distasteful of. He didn't like a lot of people. Maybe it was because it was simple, phallic, or just kind of strange. But at the end of the day, we all know what it means. Number one, mud bath. I know Steve-O has literally done something like this before, and, and, and if there's rules you should write down, write this one very down, this second, right now, write it down. Be kind to another, sorry, be kind to one another, and work hard in life, and never do anything ever that Steve-O has ever done. Those are really good rules. Trust me, it's good words to live by. So what exactly am I talking about? Well, in ancient Greece, for those who could afford it and had the time, that, well, they needed to relax. I need to relax. They needed the spa treatment. Heck, I, I've never even been to a spa. Someone take me. The ancient Greeks loved mud baths, and from what I hear, it's actually got quite a lot of benefits to it. However, the Greeks added one secret ingredient. One piece of the Krabby Patty formula I know most of us would say no to, even Plankton. Number 10, Clash of the Titans. An Avengers level threat, baby. The Titans were the big bad giants who ruled over the earth and the gods. Naturally, they all got along and there were never any problems, ever. <laughs> Yeah, right. They fought like cats and dogs, though I never understood that because all the dogs and cats I know always got along great. But the Titans fought, and, and they fought some more. Until your favorite boy Zeus had enough and kind of took control over everything. It's Zeus, it's what he does. It's too bad Aaron Yeager wasn't there to help out. Number 9, Prometheus. Poor Prometheus. This is my favorite tale from Greek mythology. I think it's rather sad for Prometheus. All he wanted to do was give us the knowledge of fire. And, and look at all the things that we did with it. Forged iron and steel, heated our homes, so no one would ever go cold again. And we cooked, which gave Gordon Ramsay 23 hit shows and a reason to curse when asking for the lamb sauce. Where's the lamb sauce? Prometheus went directly against Zeus's orders, and if you didn't know, that's kind of a bad thing. It can wind you up in a rather unfortunate position. A position like being chained up and having a large bird come feast on your intestines. Like I eat mom's spaghetti. She makes a good spaghetti, thanks mom. You make a good spaghetti. Number eight, Icarus. I think we can all relate to this one, or at least have been told a version of this when we were flush. Things were going good for us. In a nutshell, Icarus got some wax wings and gained the ability to flight. Mind you, that was probably the dream of many ancient peoples. After Icarus got his wings, he got a little arrogant. He wanted to push his wings to the limit. Kind of like Iron Man in the first Iron Man movie. But instead of falling in a multi-million dollar super suit and looking handsome while doing it, Icarus sniffed one too many of his own farts and flew too close to the sun where he burned up in it. So what's the lesson learned here, folks? Keep yourself grounded and don't sniff your own farts. <laughs> Number 7, Jason and the Argonauts. Avenger level threat acquired. For some reason in our lives, you find stories of our favorite heroes forming almighty and powerful groups. The Avengers, the Justice League, BTS. That one, that one might have too much power. But yes, Jason and the Argonauts were a band of heroes on adventures, slaying beasts, taking names, and Greekifying the area. Sadly, for Jason and the Argonauts, every time they try and make a movie about it, it just, uh, just never worked for them, I don't know. They had a visually impressive one in the 60s and everything after that has just been a complete misfire. Hollywood, if your casting calls come my way, just, just know I make a great Jason. Look at me, I, I could be Jason. A sword, a shield, and there we go, that's it. Number six, Hercules. Hercules, Hercules, the strong one. Or the one where Danny DeVito coaches him through the process of being a Greek legend. If Danny DeVito is coaching you through anything, that probably means you're gonna come out on top. And yes, before you start typing in the comment section, technically speaking, Hercules is the Roman copy of Heracles. I know. However, it's kind of one of those things that everyone just knows the one. So anytime a Greek dude shows up with muscles, you blush and you think of Hercules. As far as Greek mythology goes, it doesn't get any more classic than a super strong guy with abs and biceps. Maybe a little bit of olive oil on it, I don't know. Number five, nanorobots. Does anyone remember the first Agent Cody Banks movie where the villain like installs these evil nano 
robots and ice cubes, but they're not evil, he just uses them for evil. Initially the tech was used for good, right? To help clean up oil spills for instance, but that's, that's where my mind went when I learned this. According to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, they have created cell-sized robots that can navigate and detect issues in their environment. Now imagine that the environment is actually your lungs or your liver or your veins or your eyes. This gives scientists hope that a future where disease detection doesn't take months of waiting in line, just mere minutes. The aim of these nanobots is to help detect infection or disease within the body before it even shows. I'm not sure how I feel about tiny little robots floating inside me, but um, if I if I would be cool, I think I have to ask myself this question: If I'd be okay with Miss Frizzle shrinking a bus down and going through my nose, would I be okay with that? Then I might be okay with this. Uh, number four, we might meet aliens. So I know they said that the random monoliths that appeared around the world were made by artists. Convenient. Artists are essentially aliens. We're weird. We are so weird. It was 2020. We couldn't handle anything else. But in truth, meeting aliens may not be something that just happens in Doctor Who. In fact, Jamie Matthews, astrophysicist and professor at the University of British Columbia, said, and I quote, by the year 2118, extraterrestrial life won't be news but historical fact. I recognize that some of us might not live past 100, myself included, but that statement still implies that it could happen within that time frame. The most terrifying thought about that will be how we react to them, though by alien life it doesn't necessarily mean humanoid alien creatures with oval heads, it will most likely mean that we will find a specific kind of anaerobic bacteria, like kind of what we might find in Venus with the phosphine and everything, if you know what I'm talking about. But according to the Pentagon report, if I'm being honest here, I'm not so worried about the aliens, I'm more worried about how we're going to react to them. Will it make us more humble, fearful, arrogant? Will this be the war of the world scenario? God, I hope not. I hope we all get along and we're just a big happy space family. Unlikely. Before we land on our top three, if you're still with us, give us a like and comment on what you're looking forward to the most. Also, if you're new to the hive, give us a subscribe. We'll love you forever. Number three, a visit to Mars. So in the next few years, we are putting boots on the moon. 2024 is gonna be a big year. It has been over 50 years since astronauts last set foot on the moon and the Artemis program is set to accomplish this. But what's more exciting is what's coming next. This trip is also a kind of test drive for life support systems that will hopefully extend the trip to months, even a year. If that goes well, then the next step is Mars. NASA's InSight mission is now on Mars and its stay has been extended in order to measure how life on Mars, such as quakes and dust devils, will affect human visitors. It's also a test for how useful solar panels will be on Mars and if it's an effective form of energy. But its journey to and from the planet is the precursor to manned missions to Mars. So depending on how the next year goes, we might be around to see some astronauts on Mars. If they don't bring Mars bars, I'm going to be really upset. That's all I'm saying. Number two, space elevators. Sounds so cool. Satellites, rocket ships, and now space elevators. Oh baby. Tokyo based Obayashi Corp has boasted that they have plans to build one by 2050. China is in the race, ambitiously trying to beat them by five years. The idea of having a space elevator is considered the holy grail of space exploration, even though it sounds like a concept straight out of Willy Wonka. It will essentially be a long cable extending from the planet's surface with electromagnetic vehicles traveling along the cable to keep it from like crashing like a beanstalk back to Earth. It will be attached to a massive counterbalance on one end, like an asteroid. In fact, exactly like an asteroid. That's that's a straight up quote from NASA. They want to move an asteroid into place for this purpose. I don't know, I don't know, I feel like that's really ambitious. For some reason, I think NASA's plan may take a little longer, but it is in the works, folks. A mini elevator called Stars Me, devised by Japanese physicists, will simulate on a small scale what conditions on an elevator to the stars would encounter in a weightless environment, so. Who knows, who knows? Let's go. Number one. AI surpasses human intelligence. Ah, uh, AI, artificial intelligence. Should we be scared? I don't know. Would Mary Shelley be shaking her book at us if she saw how far we've come and are going? From apps that anticipate our needs to robots doing TED Talks, AI is here. 
and it ain't going anywhere. In May and June of 2016, Yale University and Oxford's Future of Humanity Institute took a poll of hundreds of industry leaders in order to answer just one question, will AI surpass human intelligence, and if so, when? Their findings? Well, it looks like the census is that AI will be as capable, if not more, than humans in most tasks by 2060. Add another 76 years and experts think that AI will take over all human jobs. That sucks. My first job was at Wendy's. Imagine a robot serving me. They pretty much already do. The results are based on 352 experts who responded, though I'm pretty sure there is some flux in that. We've been wrong about a lot of things before. Maybe we are about this one. Who knows? Number 10, bank robberies. Okay, when we hear about the wild, wild, rootin' tootin', wild west, whatever, we think of outlaws like Butch Cassidy's Wild Bunch, the James Younger Gang. Apparently, it was just bank robbery central back then. Just a lot of a lot of this and tapping and riding horses and stuff. That's really not true. Bank robberies didn't happen that often in real life. In fact, during the Wild West era, officially declared from 1865 to 1900, there were only eight bank robberies. Eight. That many years ago, along 15 western states, there were only eight. To put that in perspective, in 2017 alone, there were roughly 4,000 bank robberies in the United States. Much more than eight. The first armed robbery ever in history was done by the famous outlaw Jesse James and his brother Frank. This went down in 1866. The gang of outlaws robbed the Clay County Savings Association in Liberty, Missouri. Fun rootin' tootin' history. Number nine, camels. My favorite actor growing up, hands down, was Woody from Toy Story. The guy's physical comedy was on point. I know, I don't mean Tom Hanks. I mean Woody, with his crazy little cowboy run, tipping his hat. But what's a cowboy without his horse, right? As soon as Bullseye got introduced in Toy Story 2, the picture was complete. A cowboy and a horse. We've seen this combo at some point in our lives everywhere. But did you know that for around 100 years, camels were part of Texas wildlife? So imagine a cowboy on a camel. Yeah, that's real, That's that happened. Imagine two cowboys on the humps of a camel. How silly and intimidating would that look? Back in 1855, Congress spent thousands to purchase and ship feral camels from Egypt. The hot southwest would make sense when it comes to camels doing their camel thing. But by 1857, the army had 70 camels. Things were going well until, you know, the Civil War happened, and then the camels escaped and all that madness, and then from then on, for 100 years or so, they bred and roamed Texas. Yeehaw, on a camel, how fun. Number eight, cowboys. All right, since we're talking about cowboys, let's really talk about cowboys. Who were these guys? Was everybody just a cowboy off the bat, or did you have to earn it like a knight? What's the deal here? Well, the guys that we picture in our brain, like Woody, those are cattle herders, and then buffalo, thousands of them, they would roam the land to eat and find water. They would travel miles away, so the herders would follow on horseback and then drive them back to the ranch. They mostly ate beans, dried meat, obviously, and a lot of coffee. Those are the three main ingredients of yeeing and hawing. Am I a cowboy? I love beans and coffee. Coffee beans? Oh, don't even get me started. A classic Western outfit was the denim jeans and chaps, the leather covers that you know go over your legs. The large rim hats were called Stetsons. Aside from looking cool, they were large enough to keep the sun out of your eyes. That hat would also double down as a drinking bowl for their horse. Sharing is caring. Number seven, the Bison Express. Humans are responsible for the disappearance on many, many wild animals in one way or another. It's usually our fault. Yeah, going back to the wild, wild west, the year 1869 specifically, that's when the Pacific Railroad was done. It was open to the west to all these explorers, but now they were whipping across these wild lands in record speed, passing hundreds of bison every single trip. Eventually, it didn't take long for these railroads to advertise hunting excursions on these trains. So yeah, guests would climb aboard the top of the train cars and hunt on the top of the trains. Yeah, on the top, they would just shoot these animals for sport. Obviously, the train couldn't stop and go back for the bodies, so they would just leave them. This one man, Orlando Bond, nicknamed the Brick, okay, he apparently shot thousands himself. He rode the express so many times his rifle caused him to go deaf in one ear. This was done purposely to deprive Native Americans of their food supply. Now our bison's number are incredibly low, something like 2% of what it once was, and humans, well, we're still pretty garbage. What do you know? Number six, alcohol. These saloons cowboys would visit, was there a bouncer? Did you need two pieces of ID? What was the drinking age back then? Well, besides the swinging saloon doors, it really wasn't a fun time at all. 
Alcohol back then, first of all, was basically just poison. Actually, it was literally poison sometimes. They had whiskey like 40 rods and Tao's lightning. You have a couple of those and you're literally passing out in minutes. Nobody was getting cut off in old timey saloons. The bartender wasn't like, hey, how about a water, buddy? Let's get you home. No, it was a show. They had this one drink on bar rail called tarantula juice. Yeah, happy 21st birthday, go throw up. It was made from strychnine, which was actual poison. So when the whiskey wore off, the strychnine would be left over in the patron's body, and it felt like tarantulas were crawling all over your skin. Ugh, yeah, I'm good with a Bud Light Lime. Thanks, man. Number five, Sisyphus. Oh, baby, do I feel this one. Story of my life, honestly, day late and a dollar short. Some of you folks at home may also share the same fate as me and this chiseled Greek man doomed for eternity. This one is also one of my favorites. Basically, Sisyphus was cheating the devil. Cheating death itself, actually. After sliming his way out of the underworld one too many times, Big Daddy Zeus had to intervene. Also, when I say I relate to him, it's not because I'm a trickster who cheats my demise or cheats the, the devil or, or Hades. I'll explain. So, after Sisyphus had done what he'd done, Zeus sentenced him to roll a giant boulder up a hill for eternity. When he gets to the top, she rolls back down to the bottom and he has to start all over again. Every day for the rest of time. Not just life, for time. Sometimes in life it feels like you're on a grind and you work and work and work and sometimes you go right back to square one no matter how hard you work. That sucks and that can be exhausting. But never give up because Chetty ain't and neither should you. Number four, King Midas. The lesson in this one folks is to be careful what you wish for. King Midas was being granted a wish. He wished for anything I touch be turned to gold. Now I'm not an economist because I already have too many jobs on the internet but you can imagine how at today's rate of gold how wealthy you would be. Sheesh! Yeah, gold was valuable back then, but now, wow, we will. So his wish was granted, and everything he touched turned to gold, which, for a good couple hours, must have been the most fun anyone has ever had, ever. Dude was seeing drachma signs. However, this wealthy gift he had been given quickly turned into a curse or a burden. Everything he touched turned to gold. That included his food. Because of this, he starved. To fix this burden, he bathed in a river, and it said that's why gold can be found in that river. I wouldn't mind having that power myself, but if I made food gold, or even worse, what if I made my beer gold? Oh, the heart. The heart. Number three, Narcissus. This one's in the name. Basically, there was a guy named Narcissus, and he was gorgeous. Like George Clooney, Brad Pitt, Ryan Reynolds gorgeous. I'll just all put together. Oh. And he knew it, and he loved his image. Now, as a guy who goes on camera every day, naturally, you hate yourself. You hate your self-image. That's how it goes. Ask anyone here, they would tell you the same thing. But also, as someone who's on camera every day and funny from time to time, you kind of like yourself on camera, and you kind of like your self-image. It's a very strange relationship we have. However, no one is as bad as it comes to as narcissists. One day in the forest, he came across a body of water where he saw his reflection cast. And it was so handsome, so gorgeous, that he couldn't look away. Ever. Hence the name Narcissist, or Narcissist. Or what most girls in high school find out what their boyfriends have. Narcissism. Ladies, let me know. Have you ever dated someone who has narcissism or looked in the mirror too long? Let me know. I'm curious. Number two, Medusa. I feel like a lot of people know this one. Medusa, the half beautiful lady, half head of snakes in her head and, and half monster thing with powers. Yes, I realize that was three halves and that doesn't add up, but you're talking to a guy who was voted class clown in the high school yearbook and not voted most likely to succeed in math. Cause I just wouldn't. But she was the Gorgon monster who would turn men into stone. I, I, I do know that. If they looked into her eyes. That was until your boy Perseus showed up like Link with a mirror shield and gave her a taste of her own medicine. What's the lesson on this one? I'm not sure. Maybe it's don't be so sure of your abilities. Maybe it's seeing things through. Or maybe it's having an extensive knowledge of tactics from a late 90s Nintendo character. That you, you never know when you're gonna need that. You never know. I, I, I know that stuff. That can come in handy. Number one, Pandora's box. I know you guys know this one, but this one is so simple. At first glance, it's not about turning things into gold or weird snakehead ladies or giants rising from beneath the earth to fight each other. It's a box. Something ain't good in that box, but it's just a box. So don't open it. I'm gonna say it again because there's gonna be people in the comment section that are gonna say, but Chetty, because you said don't open it, that means I really wanna open it. Imagine I'm Robert De Niro telling you not to open it. Nope, no way. Nope, not gonna happen. Nope, null and void. Don't do it. Don't do it. 
That's how you know I'm serious, because I did a bad impression. Oh great, somebody opened it. Yes, that's right, Pandora's box was opened and it said that all the evils of the world were released from the box. Good tale, good moral, but who the heck thought putting all those evil things in the world in the box was a great idea? Whatever happened to just having memento boxes? You know, you open up a thing like this the time I farted on camera. Number 10, Albert. Adam, how is Queen Victoria's marriage to Prince Albert bizarre? Well, my little honeybees, not to be a pessimist, but it's bizarre because they actually really did love each other. Uh? Be honest, how often do you think it occurred that people of royal or noble birth actually got to marry someone they genuinely loved? On February 10th, 1840, Queen Victoria married Prince Albert of Saxe Coburg Gotha, who, interestingly, was her first cousin and who was actually kind of not the favorite of the British people who saw him as an outsider. As queen, she was the one to propose. Good for you, Queen. Literally. The couple stayed married for 21 years until Albert died of typhoid in 1861, and together the couple had nine children. Nine! Even after his death, Queen Victoria continued to make ruling decisions based on the principle of what would Albert do? It's such a nice way to start this heinous list. Number nine, Napoleonic Wars. Okay, a little bit of a stretch, but I would argue the Victorian era lasted from about 1814 to 1914. There's no specific date, but it could be classified around this time. The Napoleonic Wars were essentially world wars started by one man, the Corsican Ogre. Hello. Imagine having the whole world against you. No, really, the whole world against you. Britain, Prussia, Russia, Austria, and sometimes Italy took part in the coalition wars, which were just part of Napoleon's story. Trust me, this dude was arrogant and he was the antagonist of the story. He's been labeled as the greatest tactician ever. When it was all said and done, he had rediscovered ancient Egypt, fought many battles, and managed to become emperor. And he got banished twice. 8. Mummy Unwrapping Parties What is your favorite idea of a get together? Let me know down below, I won't judge, I promise. Unless, of course, you say mummy unwrapping parties like some people in the Victorian era might have. Then I will indeed judge you. Thanks to the Napoleonic Wars making their way to Egypt, interest in the country was on the up and up. And while people have been buying mummies since the Elizabethan era, now these rich weirdos bought even more, bringing them back as souvenirs. Once they got to the homestead, they would almost instantly hold parties with all their rich friends where they would unwrap their mummies like a Christmas present. Congratulations! It's exactly what you thought it would be! A five or six thousand year old decaying corpse that smells horrible. Why are rich people like this? I, I don't get it. Number 7. Fire Hazard Christmas like all families at Christmas, we all have our traditions. I'm a good boy all year, so Santa can bring me lots of gifts. Thanks, Santa. My family tradition is to watch the National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation every year. I love that movie. Adam, on the other hand, well, he's a bad boy, and he eats all the chocolate out of his advent calendar before it's time. Don't tell him I said anything, though. No. I can't help it. I'm sorry. <laughs> He's right there. However, one family Christmas tradition was quite popular back in Victorian times, oftentimes called Snapdragon. Uh, the basis of this game was to get a large bowl, fill it with dad's brandy, and drop some large raisins in said bowl. Next, get a candle or a match and uh, light it up. Now that there's a large cauldron of flaming liquid and fireballs in your living room, now your objective is to try and knock the raisins out of the dish without getting burned. Fun for the whole family, why not? Just be mindful, you know, that the whole house is made of wood and there's no fire alarms and there's no modern firefighting equipment and everyone's wearing long gowns and you get the point. Number six, maybe we were apes? November 24th, 1859 marks the day that none other than Charles Darwin published the famous and even infamous On the Origin of Species, presenting his theory of natural selection and questioning the theory of creation. Truly a great day in my opinion. Look, we can talk evolution versus creation in the comments, but there is no denying the evidence presented in On the Origin of Species had people turning heads and questioning everything they thought they knew. Its full title, on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life kind of explains it. But basically, Charles' book gave us the idea that species evolve over generations through the process of natural selection, which he backed up with evidence from the Beagle expedition in the 1830s, which to my disappointment had nothing to do with the dog breed Beagles. Number five, the gold rush. 
Picture a billboard for the wild, wild west, okay? What's on it right now? A cowboy tipping his hat in the corner with, you know, four missing teeth, a sunset in the corner, obviously, maybe a horse, and also a bunch of gold stacked up in a mine, right? Well, we've heard about the Wild West here and there, but was there really a massive gold rush? The California Gold Rush of 1849, despite what history commonly believes, wasn't the first big gold rush, not even close. The first one was back in 1799. A young man named Conrad Reed found this yellow rock right on his property. He had no idea what it was, and for years, he and his father, John Reed, used this rock as a doorstopper. You already know where I'm going with this. This 17 pound nugget of gold, which is worth a lot even today, back then this information was game changing. Congress then built the Charlotte Mint just so they could handle all this incoming gold found in North Carolina right after. Then later in 1828, more gold was discovered, but this time in Georgia. This was the second rush. Then come 1848, James Marshall found gold at Sutter's Mill, California. After the third one though, that's when the thousands moved out west. That one had the biggest pull. So it's pretty big, but not the first. Number four, the OK Corral. The shootout at the OK Corral went down on October 26th, 1881. It's known as the most famous shootout in history. But should it be, really? Going back to Tombstone, Arizona, it's 3 p.m. and we have men of the law and of course outlaws all in the same block. So naturally, trouble ensues. There's not enough land here for all of us, some rootin' tootin' shit. There were about eight men involved in the rumble, but it barely lasted 30 seconds. Also, it's important to note the gunfight at the OK Corral wasn't even at the OK Corral. It happened near the intersection of 3rd Street and Fremont Street, right behind the corral. Yeah, details matter. Three lawmen were injured and three cowboys lost their lives. Yeehaw. That's a sad yeehaw for you guys. This is why you don't organize shootouts at 3 p.m. I don't know, everyone's drunk, there's bad decisions, apparently there's bad aim. Just slam some milk, shake some hands, go home. Simple. Number three, Helena Duels. So we've talked about the bizarre ways folks would settle beef back then. They would slam tarantula juice and shoot animals from the top of locomotives, have a 30 second fist fight in the middle of the day, and then go home. But have you heard of these Helena duels? It began, of course, in Helena, Texas, AKA the toughest town on earth, at least it was back in the 1800s. The Helena duel began here. There's even a movie called The Duel with Woody Harrelson and Liam Hemsworth. They show this style of combat in a pretty brutal, Hollywood way. Both opponents had their left hands tied together with buckskin, and then each were given a small knife with an even smaller blade. It had to be short enough so it didn't reach any vital organ. That was the Texas trick. Then they're whirled around until they're dizzy, and then it gets really loud, really messy, and really bloody. Last man standing, pretty much. The crowd, of course, watches and places bets, which is always insane to me. I can't watch UFC sometimes. I don't like seeing things break, let alone a hell in a duel. Catch me inside sipping milk, texting my ex. Hard pass, freaks. Number two, train games. Entertainment was always a hit or miss when it comes to these historical lists. The Romans held gladiator battles with animals that drew in thousands of spectators from across the land. Well, in 1894, William Crush, a railway man, had this event in mind that would for sure go down in history. Oh buddy, did it ever. William Crush wanted to secure the future of the railroad company in Missouri, Kansas, and Texas. And to do so, William made an entire temporary city appropriately named the city of Crush. Nice. There was a carnival for children to enjoy and all that jazz, but the main pull for adults was the train smash. The collision of two 40-ton steam trains was meant to be the talk of the town. Look at these goliaths as they smash, or I mean crush, haha, <laughs> into each other. How fun. Yeah, the trains collided, it worked, and the darnest thing happened, um, they blew up. Yeah, it's almost like they caused a disaster for popularity, neat. 40,000 came in and many left injured. A couple of people sadly didn't leave at all. One survivor ended up getting 10 grand out of the deal. His name was JC Dean and they lost their eye in the explosion. So the company gave them a lifetime railway pass. Just the thing you want right after that horrific event. Sorry about your eye. Here's free PTSD as well. Anytime you want, enjoy. Crush was later rehired by the railway after it gained popularity. Yeah, this it happened back then too. Somebody does something horrible and then now all of a sudden they're famous. Hashtag chair girl. And finally coming in at number one, Elmer McCurdy. This one is insane. I had to end with it. Elmer McCurdy, back in 1911, he decided to be a rootin' tootin' criminal and he attempted to rob a train. Unbeknownst to him, that train was not full of gold, but rather passengers. 
Collecting a whopping $46, which back then was still pretty good, he was quickly shot by a lawman afterwards. This is where things start to get insane. Yeah, I say start. Elmer's body was embalmed and sold by The Undertaker to this traveling carnival. His body was an exhibit almost, with his story attached. And for the next 60 years, his body, this prop rather, was passed around, sold between haunted houses and wax museums. Eventually the guy's body, his real body, don't forget, ends up in California at an amusement park funhouse at Long Beach. Now, come 1976, there's a crew there filming for the Six Million Dollar Man Show, and that's when Elmer's finger breaks off accidentally. Some key grips like, whoops, revealing it was an actual mummy. They went to film the Six Million Dollar Man and ended up finding the $46 man in real life. Number 10, the papal schism, or schism, who knows? Suffice it to say that the Pope is a pretty big deal in the Catholic realm of religion, pretty much the CEO of loving Jesus the most, but it is also a position of immense power, which means there is a lot of competition for the next one in line. Usually there is one reigning Pope at a time, but at one point there were three because there was so much rivalry. Between 1378 to 1417, there wasn't just one, not two, but three rival popes, each with their own following of sacred college of cardinals. After 70 years of Pope Clement V living in Avignon, France, the Roman populace wanted a pope that was like at least Italian. Can we just get an Italian? When Pope Urban VI was elected, he proved so hostile that a bunch of cardinals went back to France and elected their own pope because the other one didn't count. They didn't like him. He thought he was voted in because people were afraid. They probably were. They elected Clement VII who lived in France, so now there were two popes. Two popes Popes, as you can guess, had a disastrous effect on the church, so people were like, okay children, if you can't play nice, either both of you resign or we will pick one for you. The popes refused to concede because they were like, no, I don't want to be pope. So cardinals arranged the Council of Pisa and elected a third pope, because that will solve everything, Alexander V, who succeeded John the 23rd. John formed the Council of Constance, then was kicked out of papacy by said council. Then the Roman pope, who is now Gregory the 12th, resigned the Avignon pope who was dismissed. Eventually, the whole schism ended when Martin V was elected in 1417. It's just so confusing. I feel like I want to vomit. Too much. Too much pulse. On number nine, Bone Wars. The early days of paleontology were intense and pretty cutthroat. Since this was a relatively new science with a plethora of things to discover, so many researchers set out to learn and find as much as they could, and this created a lot of rivalries since everyone wanted to gain notoriety for their findings. The competition was intense, but nothing could ever measure up to the rivalry between Othniel Charles Marsh and Edward Drinker Cope. These two rival paleontologists did everything in their power to throw each other off or to disprove them, and the lengths that they went to to accomplish this was almost unbelievable. Both of them took off to Montana and Utah to dig up as many fossils before the other guy did, but they just didn't stop at digging. They each hired spies and saboteurs to get in the way of others' work, and they even tried to pass off fake skeletons as well. This is where we got the Brontosaurus controversy. One of the scientists had discovered the dinosaur known as Apatosaurus, and so the other one had to one-up him and introduced his own species named the Brontosaurus. The only problem with it though was the fact that it was a skeleton of the same dinosaur but with an intentionally placed skull from another dinosaur. It was a fake. This back and forth was intense in the scientific community and made for some pretty unbelievable stories. Number 8, The Man in the Iron Mask. It is kind of crazy that this story actually exists and it could be nothing. It could have been some dude who had syphilis who didn't want anyone to see his you know. But the world remains convinced that he was more than he seemed. The movie, The Man in the Iron Mask with Leonardo DiCaprio, John Malkovich, you know, has one theory that the man was actually the twin brother of the king. But the true identity of the man in the iron mask remains a 350 year old mystery. But it happened! In 1669, a man was arrested and put in prison for 30 years and was held in the infamous Bastille prison in France until he died in 1703. He was never seen without a black velvet mask or an iron mask. It's also described. No one knew who he was or for what possible reason he was put in there. The likes of Voltaire and Alexander Dumas tried to speculate who he was, and more recently, Paul Soninio, a professor at the University of California, believed he was Eustache Doge based on prison accounts and the guard. Doge was in the prison at the same time as the masked man and was once transported in a chair covered so people wouldn't see him. But still, nothing has been confirmed, and I just think it's really cool and I like the speculation. At number seven, Valentinian, the 
the first. You know when you see someone get really mad and a lot of the time there's that one vein in their head that just pops out while their face turns red? Well that thing unalived someone once. That's right, a person once got so unbelievably angry that they died. Roman Emperor Valentinian I was known to be a pretty hot-headed guy and during his monarchy he had rivals in Danube called the Quadi tribe. Valentinian was very invested in this rivalry and they were in constant conflict with one another. In November of 375 CE, Valentinian received a note from the Quadi tribe demanding that they be left alone in peace as they supply new troops to the army of Rome. On top of that, some Quadi troops also claimed that this whole feud between them and the emperor was because of the Roman forts that were built on their land. They even claimed that because of this, they weren't obligated to follow any of the terms of the Roman treaty and that they could attack whenever they wanted. As you could imagine, hearing all the stuff from his rivals really ticked off the emperor. He got so mad that he started yelling at Quadi agents and his yelling was so intense that a blood vessel in his brain ended up bursting and he passed away shortly afterwards. Number 6 The Great Emu War I thought this event was a joke for like a very long time, but like many on this list, it actually happened. It all started in 1932 when a large emu population began devastating farms. Many of the farmers were ex-soldiers and after the devastation persisted, petitioned for military aid to defeat the pests. Keep in mind that emus can grow as tall as like 6.5 feet and have really sharp claws. They're, they're fierce. We didn't know how fierce until the Minister of Defense, George Pierce, deployed troops and expected to eradicate the pests, I don't know, very quickly. But oh, oh, oh they were in for a surprise. They vastly underestimated these killer cunning birds as they soon proved impossible to hit with machine gun fire. They just like barreled forward like Superman getting hit by bullets. Like they were like it didn't even matter. They would get hit and then just keep running. They were so fast that even their vehicles couldn't keep up with them. <laughs> it's so funny. Within a week, the military gave up and they killed only like 50 to 200 emus out of like 20,000 of them. George Pierce earned the title of Minister of the Emu War. What a way to go. Eventually they did try again later that November which resulted in 284,700 deaths of emus between 1945 to 1960. But dang, that is some pest control. But we all know that girl on TikTok who has like emus and she like puts her hand out when they try and hiss at her. They needed her. She would have just like dummied the whole population and they would have followed her like the messiah. Number five, the potato famine. The potato, so rugged, so versatile. Think of all the ways you can prepare a potato. Boiled, broiled, baked, mashed, pan fried, deep fried, french fries, hash browns, latkes, and sometimes you can put them in soup or stew. Usually pretty cheap and filling. The food of peasants and I love it. However, during 1845 Ireland, a fungus outbreak was taking hold of potato harvest all over the country. Thus creating a large famine that would see over one million people perish in a famine. Queen Victoria tried to help but was ineffective and by help I mean the same effort I put into reaching for the TV remote that's too far away on a lazy Sunday. Number 4 Body Snatching Look back in the day making a buck was not so easy. Some people who had absolutely no morals went this route. Basically, you wait around for a recently vacant grave to be not vacant and before the soil can settle you remove the inhabitant of said grave and go to your local university and say, Right, I've got this here fresh non mangled corpse, give me some money and it's all yours. And Bob's your uncle, you are now the very bottom of the barrel, detritus of human existence. But hey, you made some moolah and can afford to eat your next meal. Honestly, while you may be the worst of the worst people, it's partially the doctors and schools that are to blame for even accepting these fresh, illegally exhumed corpses for study in the first place. It may not sound like a specific event, but um, some people dressed up for it, so there's that. Number three, the tube in it. The London Underground, baby, the world's first subway. Which, let me tell you, it's kind of annoying living in Canada when you have two very popular franchises that share two common names for a rapid underground train. Metro and Subway, right? It's so annoying. You Google Metro and Subway and then the grocery store comes? I never have that. Okay. It's, maybe it's a me thing. It's a me thing. Tunnels underneath the city and trains travel through it. It's simple. Well, the first one was opened in 1863, which is an engineering feat to say the least. And it feels like forever ago. I mean, that's older than Canada for crying out loud. When you think of the Victorian era, you think horses, carriages, top hats, and orphans asking for more gruel. Mind you, the locomotive was different from a modern one, but this is a very modern idea, especially considering that 
there's no cars yet. Kind of a weird thing. Number two, the telephone. On March 7th, 1876, Scotsman Alexander Graham Bell got a patent for his invention of the telephone. Three days after acquiring the patent, Mr. Bell made his first phone call to his assistant, Thomas A. Watson, saying, Watson, come here, I want to see ya. And that was that. And we've gone downhill ever since. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. The telephone is a huge groundbreaking invention allowing people to communicate across vast distances. But the phone addiction some of us have to deal with now, man, it's rough. Alexander Graham Bell was born in Edinburgh, Scotland, and the whole reason he became interested in the idea of creating the telephone was because of his mother, who was deaf, and his father, Alexander Melville Bell, who was a teacher of elocution, and was famous for the phonetic transcription system he had developed to help the deaf learn to speak, which is really quite sweet, actually. Number one, the war to end all wars. Out of all my research about the Victorian era, the start was somewhat muddy. Maybe because historians don't want to take away from North American or Napoleon history. But the end of the Victorian era was more clear. 1914, the war to end all wars. This was the big one, folks. A mixture of militarism, imperialism, alliances, and a power struggle uh, made for a powder keg that ended up exploding in 1914. Unlike a lot of wars, this one actually changed things. Empires fell while others got stronger. Countries on maps were being redrawn. Others stayed the same. The culture? Well, it changed too. What did it? I'm not sure exactly, but what I do know is that when sitting in a wet, freezing, muddy trench for months on end, well, that's horrible, especially when the only thing you have to look at is a red paste that used to be your comrades. It was not a good time. And it made a lot of folks go a little, you know, a little crazy. Starting off with some geography, we got Lake Nyos. How can a lake kill 1,700 people? Well, though it sounds too insane to be true, it did indeed happen. Located in West Africa, the lake itself is deceptively beautiful. However, on August 21st, 1986, a mysterious cloud burst from the lake. It flooded towards the village and suffocated 1,700 people and animals. Nothing survived the event. The reason this happened is because beneath the water there is a pocket of magma that leaks carbon dioxide into the lake. The CO2 stays dissolved in the water due to the pressure of the 650 feet of water on top of the magma secretions. Crazy, so kind of like a pop bottle with an invisible lid. Until one day, that lid popped. On that day, the lake abruptly depressurized and the CO2 exploded into the air, causing the devastating event. Today, pipes are used to siphon the CO2 out from the bottom of the lake in order to prevent this from happening again. But imagine when it did happen, it must have felt like some kind of magical grim occurrence. For, for sure. Number nine, the Salem Witch Trials. If you follow me on MA, you just know how much I hate the Salem Witch Trials. I hate them so much, okay? It's an event in history that is so inconceivably stupid, it's hard to believe it actually happened. The Salem Witch Trials occurred in Massachusetts between 1692 and 1693, where more than 200 people were accused of witchcraft and 20 were put to death. It all started because the daughter of Reverend Paris, Elizabeth, who was nine, and his niece, Abigail Williams, same age, started having fits. Another girl, Anne Putnam, age 11, started having them as well. The supernatural was blamed and soon the girls began accusing everyone they could, mostly people the town didn't like. Basically, if you confessed and you wanted to be saved, then you weren't executed, but if you were accused and didn't confess, you were killed. The paranoia was so bad that once you were accused, you couldn't escape this guilt they put on you. It was insane. But after the paranoia finally subsided, the colony admitted that they probably made a mistake and compensated the families. Like, yeah, oops, might have gotten a little carried away there. Wow, Whew. I got excited, sorry guys. Here's some money. The Salem Witch Trials today represent what happens when paranoia rules a courtroom and the whole thing still beguiles the world even 300 years later. Number 8. Unsinkable Sam On a happier note, this is the kind of story that makes people believe that cats have 9 lives. Unsinkable Sam was the nickname for a cat who survived several shipwrecks during World War II. His tale begins aboard a German warship called the Bismarck. Among the 2200 soldiers was a black and white cat that somehow snuck aboard 
board. One day, the Bismarck was decimated during an attack, and while the HMS Cossack was looking for survivors, they saw Oscar the Cat, name of the time, seeking refuge on a plank, like Jack from the Titanic. They hauled him aboard, but then several months later, the Cossack would be decimated. That's shipwreck number two. This time, it was the HMS Ark Royale who spotted him and was then dubbed the name Unsinkable Sam. And then, shipwreck number three. Months later, as you can guess, the Royale was torpedoed. And once again, Sam was saved by the HMS Legion of the British Royal Fleet. Finally, this seafaring feline retired to land and later died in 1955. Number seven, Nellie Bly. Nellie Bly is a woman right out of a Jules Verne novel. In fact, you would think so if she hadn't met the man himself. In 1889, Nellie Bly took on a record-breaking voyage by traveling around the world in just 72 days. Her means of travel included a train, a steamship, a rickshaw, horse, and donkey. Her goal was to beat the fictional record set by Verne's hero Phileas Fogg in his 80-day odyssey. An event like this already appeared as a myth to the men of the time. Her editor at the New York World nearly refused to send her because her gender would make the trip impossible. No one but a man could do this, he told her. Very well, she replied. Start the man and I'll start the same day for some other newspaper and beat him. He backed down and eventually Nellie was on her way, turning fiction into reality. Number six, the Black Museum. No, I'm not talking about the Black Museum episode of Black Mirror, but honestly, not too far off. People have done some pretty vicious things to their enemies. There's a long list, but imagine turning your enemies into a permanent dinner guest because that's exactly what Ferdinand I of Naples actually did. Though everyone thought he was going to be a great king, he actually ended up being pretty psychotic. He would invite his enemies over for dinner, and while they gorged on pheasant, he would take them out, either the old fashioned way, or literally throw them out of a window. He would then retrieve and dress the bodies and stage them. He called it his black museum and would invite new acquaintances to view it so they would know exactly who they were dealing with, so not to mess with him. What a psycho. At number five, atomic tourism. If you could do anything or go anywhere while on vacation, what would you do? Maybe go on a cruise or visit a tropical destination? But how about go and watch bombs get tested? Well, if you were around in the 1950s, then atomic tourism might have been one of your options for entertainment while on vacation. In the 50s, the US was expanding its arsenal of nuclear weapons due to the threat of the Soviet Union and their nuclear firepower. Because this was such a big thing, Thing, the Tourist Bureau of Las Vegas decided to profit off the US military's weapons testing and make an entire attraction out of it. Because testing for these nuclear weapons took place in the desert in Nevada, a tourist site was set up a safe distance away so that people could watch these weapons be detonated as well as have a beautiful view of the Nevada horizon. People would bring picnics to watch the nuclear weapons and at nighttime they would throw parties while they waited for the next explosion. It's such a weird tourist attraction but then again the 1950s were also a weird time anyway. Number four, Agent 355. So they are actually making a movie inspired by this one because of course it would make a great movie. Move over 007, there is a new agent in town and I smell an excellent film legacy brewing. After a hasty retreat made by George Washington leaving more control in British hands, he needed to come up with a stealthier way to retaliate. Thus, the Culper spy ring was born. This intelligence operation was so good at keeping secrets, some of the identities of the spies were never revealed, especially the identity of Agent 3. Not even Washington himself knew who was working for him or who was 355, but we do know that they were a female agent, a spy of expert skill. It was because of her that the head of England's intelligence, Major John Andre, was arrested. Notoriously handsome and debonair, 355 could have been any of the women that fawned over him at parties, gathering his secrets. One secret in particular was his plan to sell West Point to the British. After documents pertaining to his ordeal was uncovered, he was arrested and condemned. But after as to who would be directly thanked for this capture was unknown. The only other suspected fact about her was that a female spy was reportedly killed on a prison ship in 1780. Of course, there are theories regarding her real identity, but Agent 355 was so good at her job that who she was and what else she did would be taken to her grave. At number three, Chrysippus. You know how when you laugh really hard, you start gasping for air and your stomach starts to hurt from tensing up your body so much? Well, this once killed someone. A Greek philosopher named Chrysippus actually 
actually died from laughter. In the 3rd century BCE, the philosopher laughed so hard because he saw his donkey eating figs and then he kicked the bucket so to speak. According to science, death by laughter can occur because of asphyxiation, because you just can't breathe because you're laughing so hard, or through an aneurysm because of the tension from laughing. What's so wild about this is the fact that this wasn't the first time in history that death by laughter has happened. It is said that Cleopatra's father died the same way because he was laughing at the death of her husband and a 5th century Greek painter met the same fate because he laughed too hard at one of his own paintings. And a Danish audiologist passed away in a similar fashion in 1989 because he saw a funny scene in a movie that raised his heart rate so much that he died. Number two, the first marathon. The Battle of Marathon is one of the most famous Greek battles in history, and it's also epic, and I also can't believe it happened because it's so cool. Back in 490 BC, the Greeks faced off against the invading Persians on the plains of Marathon. It was a victory that would go down in history as a testament to courage and excellence. But it wasn't only the battle itself, but a man named Phidippes whose actions were so insane, some people think it was a myth. He was sent to enlist the help of Spartans before the battle, so he ran to Sparta but stopped in Athens. The total distance was 240 kilometers, like there and back. I can barely make 4 kilometers, imagine 240 kilometers on foot. He wasn't just like a basic guy though, he was what was called a hemerodromos, a sacred day long runner in the military. They were known for covering incredible distances by foot, even for going sleep. They would most likely have consumed figs and cured meat, like that's it. His journey inspired the marathon's run today, and even some have tried to make the exact trek he did. Meanwhile, it's a struggle for me to even do like a half hour workout at the end of the day. <laughs> And finally, at number one, Robert Liston. Robert Liston was probably the worst doctor in the history of medicine because he messed up so bad it is unbelievable. This surgeon in the 1800s performed a surgery that had a 300% mortality rate. So he went in to help someone and ended up killing three people as a result. Liston was performing a simple leg amputation but was working so fast that he ended up cutting off two of his assistant's fingers during the procedure. Both the assistant and and the patient ended up passing away after contracting gangrene. Now you're probably asking yourself, well, what about the third person? You said this had a 300% mortality rate. Well, let me tell you how the third person perished. During the procedure, Liston swiped near an elderly doctor with one of his blades. Thinking that he had been cut, the doctor started freaking out and went into shock. The stress was so much that the doctor ended up having a heart attack and passed away. So in the end, Robert Liston killed three people trying to save one life and failed miserably. Kicking off the list at number 10, dark dining. I don't know about you, but I can't eat in the dark. I need to see every single bite that I'm eating, okay? Call me crazy. Part of me wants to go to a restaurant where you can't see anything, but I know that I won't make it all the way through. I can't do it. I like, I have a thing. I have to just, I'm not blindly, what if it's not cooked? I don't know. Back in the Victorian era, dining in complete darkness wasn't just a date night. It was actually the best way to digest, or so they thought. That's why many Victorian era homes had their dining rooms set up in their basement. How random is that? Oh, do you guys have poker nights down here? Nah, just brunch. Kill the light. <laughs> what? How do you like your eggs? Turn off the light. <laughs> what are we doing? Number nine, saved by the bell. I'm sure you've heard about this at some point, but allow me to go into grim detail. In the late 1700s, cholera, bacterial infections, everything bad, you name it, it was all spreading. Not an ideal time to be alive. Many were biting the bullet at this time, of course being gravely ill, but with this came a dark trend. The safety coffin. Yeah, we got a safety, we had the safety dance, now we got the safety coffin, here we go. These coffins, I mean, God forbid you were buried alive, these safety coffins would allow the dead to rise again and exit said coffin. A lot of these coffins have extra comfort on the inside and of course, a wire. This wire ran through the coffin, through the ground and attached to a bell on the outside. So if a passerby or heard it, one, that would be so scary, but if they heard it, they would know something's up and they would help them out. Folks would get creative with their safety coffins. For example, a man named Robert Robinson from Manchester, he passed in 1791, but he instructed his family and watchmen to open the special door on his casket, revealing a layer of glass. Now, if anybody were to see condensation, he could then be removed. Patent number 81,437. It was actually granted to Franz Vester in 1868. It was an approved burial case, a real patent. This was a real coffin. This is crazy. This one had an air inlet, a ladder, and a bell. All three, there you go. The description of the patent says, if too weak to ascend by the ladder, he could ring the bell, giving the desired alarm for help, and thus save himself from premature death by being buried alive. 
Nice. You thought you died. Psych, climb this ladder. There you go. Good luck getting out. Now you're in an escape room. Enjoy. You only get two hints. Like a walkie talkie. Hey, uh, how do I get out of the coffin in room B? Number eight, no air. Now that song's gonna be stuck in your head. Jordan Sparks, a classic. Since we're on the topic of safety coffins, I had to include one more. Maybe two more, I'll never tell. This one is fascinating. The science involved here was honestly impressive. There was the classic wire and bell method, but the more sick people got, the more creative they had to become. Like for example, patent number 268,693, John Krishbaum's device for indicating life in buried persons. Yeah, an 1882 classic, we love this. We got the iPod Nano, they got the device o life. Nice. Upon first glance, you may think this is some type of medieval punishment, whatever, but really this device detects movement whilst providing much needed air. Now you obviously can't have a hole in the ground or else rats will make your real demise much worse than suffocating, right? So John's device here, as per the disclosure details, is that if the person buried should come to life, a motion of his hands will turn the branches of the T-shaped pipe upon or near which his hands are placed. A marked scale on the side of the top indicates movement of the T and air will then pass come down the pipe. Once sufficient time has passed to assure the person is dead, the device can be removed. Yeah, imagine waking up with this in your hands. I wouldn't be calm enough to turn it and then breathe in a passive amount of air. No way, there's nothing passive about waking up in a coffin. Number seven, bad hair day. Okay, you want it messed up? Let's do messed up. Hope you're not eating any food right now, especially not eating in the dark. Two red flags. Okay, the Liverpool Daily Post back in 1869 had readers invested on this fateful day. Right on the cover it read, a 30 year old passed away in the village of Lincolnshire. Now at the time, that's not far off from average life expectancy in the 1800s. But this case was odd. Everyone wanted to read about this. This case was noteworthy. It was important that folks understood what took this young lady's life. Doctors asked the family if they can carry out a post-mortem and lo and behold, they found a two pound solid chunk of hair sitting in her stomach. Two pounds. That's what happened. That's how she met her fate. That's horrible. This ball of hair caused an ulceration of the stomach and ultimately caused her death. The woman's sister did note that over the last dozen years or so, she had casually been eating her own hair. So at this time I say, if you know anybody eating hair, send them this link. It's not a good idea. Cut that out. Stop doing that. Number six, the Great Famine. Weird time to talk about a famine after the hair incident, but okay, here we go. Back in 1845, a potato crop that a lot of the Irish population relied on was no longer available. This was huge. This is bad history right here. A group of microorganisms wiped them all out and in result, around 1 million folks died or had to leave. It was draconian law at this point and British ruling that made the exported food hard to reach people. This famine led to Irish independence and anti-union movements. Historical, definitely. Messed up, absolutely. Number, Number five, Sir Adrian Cotton de Watt. Love that name. There are gonna be a couple unbelievable events on this list from World War II, so just a heads up. But truth be told, the war itself is kind of hard to believe. Sir Adrian Cotton de Wart was not only a man who survived the impossible once, but he made a career out of it. He wasn't like your black adder general in the back with a pipe. This dude was on the front lines tossing grenades with one arm because he already lost the other. He served in the Boer War, World War I, and World War II. He survived being shot in the face, skull, hip, leg, ankle, and ear. One eye and one arm short, this enthusiastic war hero dove into the bloodshed again and again. He was seen pulling pins out of grenades and throwing them with his one good arm during Battle of the Somme. But even as a six-year-old man, he was still a beast. His plane got shot down in April 1941. He crashed it into the Mediterranean, survived, swam all the way to shore. Then he got captured by Italian soldiers, thrown into a POW camp. Then he escaped, eluded capture for eight days. But unfortunately, the lack of Italian looks gave him away. He was released two years later and Churchill was such a big fan of him, he made him his rep over in China. He ended up passing away peacefully at age 83 despite hundreds of close calls with death. Number four, Simo Heha. This is actually kind of a plug for a short film I'm looking to raise funds for. Check out my Instagram to learn more. But his story is incredible and it's so unbelievable. Simo Heha's story sounds like something straight out of a movie, except it actually happened. A humble Finnish farmer who became the Soviet nightmare in World War II. He is widely regarded as one of the most accomplished and skilled snipers in history. The Winter War began in Finland in 1939 after Russia decided that it was time to regain some territory. They thought it was going to be easy. But soon they came to fear the man who would be known as the White Death. 
He was trained as a sniper at a young age, didn't want to take human lives though, so he just became a farmer, but the lives of his countrymen were at stake. The winter war lasted just over 100 days and within that time, Simo hit as many as 500 men, his personal best being 40 confirmed hits in one day. Some people estimate that it was over 800 people. In March 1940, he was hit in the jaw by a counter sniper, leaving him in a coma for 11 days. But when he awoke, however, the Russians surrendered. That is poetic justice. Number three, Alexander the Great. How did this guy exist? Was he the son of Zeus? The case is so convincing that even Alexander believed it himself. During the 15 years of his conquest, starting from his first victory when he was 18, Alexander never lost a battle. He was so prolific in battle that his strategies are still studied to this day. Before Alexander entered Egypt, they had been under Persian rule for just over 200 years. Through his incredible prowess and lightning quick decision making, Alexander defeated them. Egypt was so happy they even claimed him as their pharaoh. While he was in Egypt, however, Alexander decided to make the long trek to visit the shrine of Zeus Ammon. According to the man himself, he was guided there by ravens and it even rained during his journey which was interpreted as a blessing. When he got there, the priest named him a son of Zeus. Now if that doesn't make this guy sound like a myth, then I I don't know what will. Number two, Bodicea. Bodicea is the Morrigan in my mind. She is Xena, warrior princess. This woman was so ferocious, she was called the scourge of the Roman Empire. Yeah, that's right, this queen took on the Roman Empire. At the time Rome was invading the south of Britain, Queen Bodicea ruled the Inseni tribe of East Anglia along her husband, King Prasutagus. Though her early days remain mostly a mystery, she remains among the canon of heroes who defended the British Isles. She was fearsome to behold, with flaming red hair and a gaze so sharp it could cut glass. She and her husband fought against the Romans until his death, after which the Romans drove straight to take her on. They attacked her daughters publicly, which like Mother Bear, not a good idea, after which she toured in a chariot rallying the people in rebellion. She sat three Roman cities and took no prisoners. She annihilated the 9th legion when she took out their entire relief force. Sadly though, Bodicea fell after a vicious battle, but her name echoes in the halls of heroes. And last but not least, Richard, Saladin, and the Third Crusade. Just the Crusades in general are just unbelievable. Never in history have two rulers been so equally matched. Currently I'm reading Warriors of God, Richard the Lionheart, and Saladin and the Third Crusade by James Rustin. And the fact that everything I've read so far like, isn't just the next Game of Thrones novel astounds me. These two never met because Saladin believed that kings should not go to war if they had met, but because they were fighting over the Holy Land, war was kind of inevitable. But while Saladin did not engage in warfare, Richard dove right in the middle of everything. They both had such incredible admiration for each other that in the middle of battles, they would send each other gifts. Like, I don't understand. You killed my men, you killed my men. Here's a fruit basket literally happened, and another example, during the Battle of Jaffa, Richard's horse ended up being killed and Saladin was so impressed with him that he sent him two new ones. Two! On top of that, Richard had taken off half of his armor before he had left ashore to fight. So he was like, basically like, half naked. Huh. Eventually Saladin tried to have him assassinated, but Richard was so ferocious in battle that everyone feared him. The dude was pretty much a human bulldozer. The two assassins ended up waking up the camp because they were fighting about who should take the guy out. At number 10, population. It's pretty messed up just how many slaves there were in ancient Rome. In their society, wealthy people owned dozens if not hundreds of slaves to do their menial work. In ancient Rome, anyone could be sold into slavery. No matter your race or background, if you could work, you could be bought and sold. Historians believe that about 90% of the free people in Italy by the first century BCE had ancestors who were slaves. At one point, the Roman Senate debated having slaves wear uniforms to be able to distinguish them from the rest of society, but they ultimately decided against it when they realized just how many slaves there were. One ancient Roman politician once said, quote, it was once proposed in the Senate that slaves should be distinguished from free people by their dress. But then it was realized how great and danger this would be if our slaves began to count us, end quote. They literally couldn't afford to let the slaves know how many other slaves there were because if they would have known they outnumbered the other members of society, this could have led to a revolt. I mean, there were slave revolts regardless, but we will get to that later. At number nine, 
lifestyle. Ancient Roman slaves experienced different lifestyles and living conditions based on a number of factors, often linked to their occupations. Slaves who didn't have a specific skill or trade were often used in mines and agriculture, and those were the harshest conditions that they could have been subjected to. Oftentimes, they were literally worked to death, and since they didn't have any human rights in the eyes of the Romans, they were often overlooked and simply replaced. On the other hand, household slaves received more humane treatment. They were treated better by their masters, and sometimes they were able to get some money in order to buy their freedom. If they were able to buy their freedom, the slaves would become freedmen, which was a social class between slaves and free people. Before we continue discussing the hard lives of slaves in ancient Rome, make sure you guys smash that thumbs up button if you're thoroughly entertained so far, and maybe even consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Spartacus. At one point, a group of Roman slaves revolted, and though they eventually lost their battle, they survived a pretty long time thanks to one famous slave named Spartacus. Spartacus was a slave who escaped a gladiatorial training camp and recruited thousands of other slaves to fight for their freedom alongside him. For the slaves, Spartacus was their symbol of hope and their leader. This slave army was able to defy Roman authorities for two years with freedom in their sights, but unfortunately those dreams were crushed when Roman general Crassus crushed Spartacus and his army. After Spartacus was killed, the authorities came for the rest of the slaves in the army and they were severely punished. 6,000 slaves who took part in the revolt were crucified, and this was almost a warning to the other slaves against trying to revolt again. Spartacus became a legend, but it wasn't enough to free the Roman slaves. At number 7, Ownership In ancient Rome, slavery and slave ownership was such a common practice that pretty much everyone owned slaves, regardless of social status. Even some of the poorest Roman citizens would own one or two slaves. Obviously, the more money you had back then, the more slaves you could afford. In Roman Egypt, the average artisan owned about two or three slaves each. Emperor Nero was known to have owned over 400 slaves who lived and worked in his home in the city, but his numbers are eclipsed by a wealthy Roman named Gaius Caecilius Isidorus, who according to historical records owned 4,166 slaves at the time of his death. That just gives you an idea of just how many people were sold into slavery in the first place. At number 6, freedom. Earlier I mentioned that Roman slaves had the chance to buy their freedom. It was a lengthy process, but this gave a lot of slaves hope for a better life. Things weren't always better after buying their freedom though, and many of them sold themselves back into slavery because things were tough. The process of buying your freedom as a slave was called manumission. This could be achieved in a number of ways. Slave master could grant their slave freedom as a reward for their service and loyalty. The slave could pay their master a sum of money to be freed, or sometimes a slave master could just find it convenient to let their slave go. Most slave masters who chose that last option to free their slave for their own benefit were merchants who needed someone to be able to sign contracts on their behalf, and since slaves weren't allowed to represent their masters from a legal standpoint, they would be freed, but would still work for their master. You also had to be over the age of 30 to buy your freedom, so if you were lucky to live that long, then there was hope of being freed, but with the average life expectancy in ancient Rome being about 28 years or so, and with the living conditions of many slaves, they would be lucky to get that opportunity. For five, Queen Victoria's name change. Every year on May 2-4, we set off fireworks, then we have way too many hot dogs. It's the best. We call it Victoria Day, right? It's for sure called Victoria Day, right? Well, back in 1819, Victoria was christened in an almost private ceremony. It was small, obviously. Victoria's uncle only let a few people attend. Like I mentioned in part one, she had an isolated childhood with the whole Kensington system that was no way to live. But even the day she was christened, trouble awaited. Her name was Alexandrina Victoria, and at the time, the name Victoria was not regal. It was a French origin, almost an odd name to have at the time, so she was immediately advised to change her name to something more traditional. But as our calendars can definitely confirm, she said, nope, I'm good. Victoria Day. Yeah, it's definitely Victoria Day. Number four, tattoos. I only have the one tattoo, but I've always wanted more. Just not so good with needles, you know? I got my eyebrow pierced and I fainted. It's a fun fact, I have a little scar there. Not great with needles. Some of the designs are so beautiful on tattoos, the amount of pain you all sit through, I'm impressed, honestly, mad respect. The tattoo craze really took off once Queen Victoria's son, the Prince of Wales, he went and visited Jerusalem. And of course he saw copious amounts of body art and was inspired. Inspired, we'll say, yeah. So upon his return, he was all about ink at this point. And the Prince of Wales, well if he has a sleeve, well then maybe I can have a sleeve, right? What's going on? It wasn't a sleeve, really. It was a cross. The prince got a tattoo of a cross in homage to the Crusades. So if you're gonna try and convince your parents to let you get a tattoo, just, you know, tell them the Prince of Wales did, right? You're just trying to be a royal. Number three, gym day. 
Believe it or not, they were around 200 gems across Europe during Victorian times. Yeah, just like six good lives. So you're like, what? What's this about? Even Victorian dudes skip leg day. How great is that? Okay, it's not just you. These gyms weren't bright, they weren't open, they weren't well ventilated, they weren't motivating, and definitely not safe. None of those, definitely not. No, Victorian gyms were reserved for the upper class, obviously. Grab your pocket watch and blazer, Ezekiel. We're doing squats today. These machines also were not ideal. They were designed as antiques first rather than their purpose. Also, half of these look like saw traps. Like, are you kidding me? No way I'd bend my arm around any of these devices. No way. All those wooden wheels? No. I'll stay weak and brittle. Thank you. Number two, ghost photography. Had to look back. I don't like talking about ghosts. As if the reanimated corpses coming back to life while they were ringing a bell wasn't scary enough. Yeah, let's talk about 1800s ghost photography. The camera was a hot new invention at this time, so tales of ghosts and spirits were now easily believed. Yeah, obviously, when you have a photo of a see-through woman, you're like, I, that must be, that's pretty terrifying. A big name in the ghost game was a man named William Thomas Stead. He was born in 1849 and Stead was the son of a Congregationalist minister and at the age of 22, he was appointed as editor of Northern Echo, which was a regional newspaper in Darlington. So far, so good. This British medium, Richard Borsonal, featured a photo of W.T. Stead and a real spirit. Yeah, imagine that. Imagine a day where somebody being awarded the Nobel Peace Prize also poses for photo ops with ghosts. You're like, I don't, do we believe all of this or none of this? What's going on? This is so scary. And finally, number one, music for eternity. Before we wrap up this wild part two, I had to include perhaps one of the creepiest patents of all time. Patent numero 9,222,059. Yeah, the number is going a little bit higher. This one got me thinking. I wanted to end this video off on this note. I like this idea. Maybe, I don't know yet. Music for Eternity Systems. Okay, this patent is not from the 1800s, but rather 2015. I know, it's not Victorian, but when else am I gonna talk about this, really? The idea here is that you could stay connected to your loved one by using a solar-powered digital music player. The best part here is the patent details how surviving family members now have the ability to update, revise, and edit stored audio files and programming after burial. Yeah, next Rihanna album, no problem, I got you. There's a speaker in the casket and there's a headphone jack on the tombstone so we can listen together and then we can decide if we hate the album. That's creepy, I wouldn't do this. Would you want this? Sound off below if you'd want, you know, big shiny tunes playing for eternity after you die. I would do the Titanic theme song, just make everyone so sad all the time. Kicking off the list at number 10, the golden toad. Scientists usually use frogs as a diagnostic for how things are going to go on our planet. And the answer is not good. Usually it's not good. Especially not for the froggy woggies. Amphibians breathe through their skin, which I gotta say, one, gross, but it makes them extra sensitive to changes in their environment. The golden toad extinction event happened pretty recently and very quickly. In their native home of Costa Rica, it was considered a good omen, or lucky if you saw it, but then sightings of this shiny dude became less and less, and then poof! 1987, these tiny little guys started to disappear one by one. Like the dreams we had as kids, almost, some would say. The local population was ill at ease and they had good reason to be. Alongside the golden toad, nearly half of all frogs and toads also started dying within a 30 kilometer range. And even stranger is that the area was free from human intervention, which led scientists to conclude that the cause was related to, you guessed it, climate change. As the temperatures rose, the frogs became more susceptible to the chytrid fungus, which decimated frog populations worldwide. And in 1989, the golden toad was the first species to become extinct as a direct result of climate change. Sad stuff. Rachel recommends reading The Sixth Extinction by Elizabeth Colbert because, well, it's a good one, so check it out yourselves. Number nine, the Pina Island tortoise. When the Mayans said the world was going to end in 2012, they may have just been onto something. We lost the last Pina giant tortoise back in 2012 and his name was Lonesome George. His name was Lonesome George. I'm gonna be the first to cry on this. And for decades before his passing, scientists were trying to get him to mate with females of a similar subspecies, but he just wasn't feeling it. To be fair, look at him. The guy looks exhausted. He looks like he needs three coffees before swiping right on mating apps. <laughs> oh, Lonesome George and his wrinkly necked friends. <laughs> this is sad, Taylor. Lonesome George and his wrinkly necked friends weighed in at about 400 pounds growing up to six feet long. 
Again, this extinction comes back to us humans with the use of tortoises as an onboard food in the 19th century and the goat population of Pinta Island growing rapidly during the 60s and 70s. These tortoises ran out of food. Number eight, the Labrador duck. I love ducks. You might as well play Goose Goose Duck because sadly, the Labrador duck is no more. But even before it went extinct, the Labrador duck was always rare and it served that way. Also referred to as the pied duck or the skunk duck due to its coloring, not its smell. Not much is known about its behavior and habitat, but we do know that it liked to hang out in sheltered bays, sandbars, harbors in New Jersey, Long Island, New England, and of course, coastal Labrador, northern Quebec. Did it have a New York accent? <laughs> Did it have a New York accent or a Canadian one? We just can't be sure. We've been looking, but honestly, we don't know at this point. The Labrador duck went extinct in the 1870s, but the direct cause is still unknown. Was it eaten to death? We don't know. The bird was known to taste bad, but it was pretty cheap for meat at the market, so that could be one possibility. But the ducks were actually hunted for their feathers more than their meat and their eggs were harvested as well. Another reason is that they were often in competition with us over their main food source, which were, as you would have guessed, mollusks. Human interaction obviously played a massive role in its ducktails, especially considering the last known specimen was shot in New York. Shot in New York. Not a movie, assassinated in New York. Did they realize what was happening around the time? Probably, yeah, realistically probably. But it just goes to show how much the level of care has differed over the last century in relation to extinction. Number seven, the great auk. Its name makes you think this thing is the size of a moose or it's some type of ox, when in fact it's really just a cute flightless seabird was, rather. Once belonging in colonies off North Atlantic coast, the great auk would grow up to 30 inches long and its tiny wings would only be used to swim. Water wings. They were much smaller than 13 centimeters long. Little penguin flappy arm, no wonder they couldn't fly. They were cute, but quite defenseless. Around the 1500s, European fishermen discovered this perfect area for hunting, and it just happened to be where most of these great auks were hanging out. Newfoundland looked like the iceberg in Club Penguin, so quite a few of them bit the bullet. By the 1950s, the last two known specimens were hunted by a fisherman on LD Island, just off the coast of Iceland. So if you need to pay your respects, that's where you need to head. Number six, the stellar sea cow. Just like bumblebees are the whales of the insect world, they were the cows of the sea. <clears throat> okay, I know, I think I know about these cows. Hailing from the same order as the manatee, the stellar sea cow was a stellar sea animal until the very end, but they may return one day. Fingers crossed, more on that in a second. The stellar sea cow was named after George Wilhelm Steller, who discovered this massive blubbery creature in 1741 during the Vitus Bearings Great Northern Expedition after the crew became shipwrecked. Adults would have weighed about 9,000 kilograms and could reach lengths past 11 meters. That's a whole lot of cow. Despite surviving since the Pleistocene epoch over 2.6 million 11,000 years ago, there were no match for humans. They only swam at a meter deep and communicated via huffs and sighs to their family and lifelong partners, as I do normally. Are you hungry? <sighs> kind of. George Steller commented that the animals had an uncommon love for their families, which made it incredibly easy to hunt them. Okay, that's really depressing. Leave it to humans to exploit love in order to kill. Classic Bruce Willis stuff. Considering the one year gestation period, the species just couldn't reproduce fast enough to keep up with the hunting, so they just died. But they may return. Scientists were able to sequence the genome, which can mean we could see these creatures again one day. At number five, demand. In ancient Rome, there was an incredibly high demand for slaves, but since there were so many slaves in Rome, there was always work for them. Oftentimes, people sold themselves or their children into slavery in order to pay off their debts, so when it came to being bought, that came pretty easy. Other than public office, slaves were used for almost every activity in ancient Rome. The most common slave trade was mining because workers were always in demand, mostly due to the high level of danger that came with the job, and the fact that many slaves were injured or died while working in the mines, and slave masters needed to to keep replacing those who could no longer work. Domestic labor and farming were also high demand jobs for slaves back then. Back then, the logic behind using slave labor for these types of jobs was that, quote, free labor should be used in unhealthy places, end quote. Basically, they believed that it was better to have a slave pass away on the job than a free person because it would impact their business less. 
At number four, procurement. The way that slaves were acquired in ancient Rome was pretty messed up, I will say. Typically, slaves were acquired through four different ways. They would be brought in as war captives, as victims of pirate raids, by trade, or by breeding. During the early expansion of the Roman Empire, many war captives were turned into slaves. The pirates from Sicilia, located in what is now modern day Turkey, did business with the Romans and supplied them with a lot of their slaves. The pirates would bring their slaves to the island of Delos, which back then was considered to be the international center of slave trading. The slave trade was such a big deal back then that it has been recorded that on at least one occasion, 10,000 people were traded as slaves and shipped back to Italy in one day. This was a big business opportunity for a lot of people, but of course, no one ever considered the lives of the people they were buying and selling. At number three, fugitives. As you can imagine, life as a slave in ancient Rome or at any period of time wasn't easy. Living conditions were poor, it was dangerous, and no one should ever be treated like that or used for free labor. Many slaves have been known to escape and obviously the same went for those in ancient Rome. Slaves running away from their masters was a common thing back then, and to deal with it, slave owners would hire professional slave catchers to hunt down, capture, and return the escaped slave back to their owner. For slave owners who wanted to take matters into their own hands, they would advertise rewards for those who could return their slaves, or they would just try and locate their slave themselves. Some slave owners had ways of preventing their slaves from getting away, like using collars with instructions on where to return the escaped slave, much like a dog collar, which is just dehumanizing. At number two, revolts. In Roman times, slave revolts were pretty common. There have been a number of recorded slave revolts in Roman history. I mentioned the one that was led by Spartacus, but there's another pretty famous Roman slave revolt that was led by a man named Eunice. Eunice led a revolt that happened in Sicily from 135 to 132 BCE. It is said that Eunice believed himself to be a prophet and claimed to have several mystical visions. Eunice was able to persuade a number of other slaves to follow him when he performed a trick where sparks and flames came out of his mouth. They believed that he was magical and so they followed him to try and fight back against the Roman forces. Unfortunately, they were defeated, but the example that they set is believed to have inspired yet another slave revolt in Sicily later in 104 to 103 BCE. And finally, at number one, totally normal. Probably the most messed up thing about life as a Roman slave was just how normal slavery was in society. I mean, the Roman people were so invested in their slaves that they continuously tried to crush their revolts and they tried everything in their power to keep them from escaping. Even the sheer number of slaves that were in their society just shows how important slavery was to them. Back then, slavery was just an unquestioned institution. For many, it was just a normal part of life, which is actually quite frightening when you think about it. There is no recorded history of Romans ever questioning slavery in their society, and all economic, legal, and social forces in Rome at this time worked hard to try and preserve slavery as part of their society. To the ancient Romans, slaves were seen as the direct opposite of free people, which they believed was a necessary balance that they needed in their society. They never completely got rid of slavery either. Though they did try and create new rules and laws to make life as a slave more bearable, they were still bought and sold into servitude and were seen as property and lesser people. Yeah.